Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today, we're going back to the great state of South Carolina and talking to Mr. Rick Cope. Rick, how are you doing? We're doing great, my friend. Thank you for the invite. Yes, sir. Glad to have you on. I was I was telling, we were all talking earlier about how you have definitely one of the better backgrounds so far on the Southern Outdoorsman <laughs> Video Podcast. So I'm not even going to describe it. If people are listening, they got to go look at it. They got to go check it out on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Jacob, how you doing? Oh, well, dude, doing well. Listen, Rick, this is like uh, almost, I almost say it's almost two years in the making, I feel like. Uh, when, when, did uh, you, yeah. when did you do your seminar? Because that's when I first had kind of found out about you right before the seminar you did. Um, I believe it was at this past hunting season, but the one before that. So I think you're correct. It was two years ago. Yeah. And we did that at our church there in Lancaster County in South Carolina. So. Yeah. So the, you're a gentleman. I cannot remember how even I found out about you, but we kind of gone back and forth. And again, like a couple of our past guests this year, it's taking about two years for this to progress and actually, uh, you know, make something happen, which again is worth the wait. And I'm excited to have you on uh, because one thing that listeners are going to learn about you is you're a big time bow hunter and woodsmanship skill sets when it comes to hunting features is a big part of what you do and kind of what you've learned over the last say 40 years of bow hunting um so rick to kind of jump into this conversation i, I really want you to kind of start discussing give us an idea of your background what area of the state are you from and how did you get introduced to bow hunting especially with your mentor sonny okay so yeah um like a lot of guys in the south you know we grow up in the woods and Dad's were taking me hunting when I was about nine years old. Most of that was dog hunting because that's allowed in our state in the lower part of the state. I live in the Lancaster County region up on the upper side of the state, right on the Charlotte, North Carolina line. So I'm on the South Carolina side, and we can literally about throw a rock and hit North Carolina. So our region is all primarily still hunting, but dog hunting was in the south. And that's kind of where I grew up, a child all the way through basically my teen years, and then once I started getting my teen years, we started, you know, getting more into steel hunting. But, you know, I'm 57 years old, so there was no technology. You know, you had to learn from the old school boys, and, uh, and which I still believe is one of some of the best ways to do this. Uh, I think the means of technology is well, like we're doing now, to inform. But, man, there's nothing like getting with people that know woodsmanship and how a deer reacts and, you know, and how he thinks really, you know. And, uh, but at about 20 years old, uh, I did uh, come in contact with a guy who was a taxidermy. My dad had killed a pretty nice deer and sent this guy. When I walked in this guy's house, I was just flabbergasted, man. I like, because it was all I could do, you know, to buy deer for a thousand dollars with a pack of dogs on his tail. You know, I, mean, I might see one a year, you know, it's the kid, you know. And I walk in this guy and he's like collecting them, man. He's just, he's, he's a phenomenon. He's got, six or seven state records in the book and he's got several he has never published and i thought man you know so i told him basically you're going to teach me how to do this or i'm gonna start sleeping on your doorstep you know what i mean <laughs> and he just and he just laughed you know and i was about 20 years old working third shift and i'd get off in the morning go grab a biscuit with him and took me on his wing and started teaching me some stuff and uh i'll, I'll dare say you know i think all knowledge is passed down from generation to generation and I was just very blessed to know him, still know him to this day. And uh, he's about 80 years old, lives in Great Falls, South Carolina. His name's Sonny Burgess. And uh, he is a phenomenon when it comes concerns hunting and steel hunting, bow hunting especially. I've never met anybody to this day like this guy. Mm. Mm, well, okay, so, Rick, to give us even more background, first off, i got to say this. I'm just going to put this on the podcast. I think we could ha somehow try to get Sonny on the podcast because I remember yeah. he was at your seminar, <laughs> yeah. and I remember him kind of getting up on stage and kind of talking, or maybe he was sitting in the front row, and I remember you kind of pointing out and talking about, like, you know, how big of an influence he was for you and your success, which is just fascinating. And it's amazing, you know, you still got guys like that around uh, because, unfortunately, a lot of those guys are passing away, unfortunately. But, you know, a guy like yeah. him, like Sonny, who's got that skill set that's, you know, also not in the skill set, but he's got the wall as well to kind of back it up that kind of proves the proof of concept that he does but i, I want you to talk about the uh the story you mentioned to us before we get on the podcast it gives listeners even more of a background uh and maybe like a a, a foot in the door of, of what we're gonna be discussing which we're gonna talk a lot about feed trees in this episode can you talk about that that 89 1989 season when you were struggling with the hurricane and everything and when you had Sonny come out there on that property with you and your brother and kind of just what you learned uh, from him in such a quick manner of time from not being on deer and not finding deer to, you know, being on deer every sit you had. Well, so um, 
over the course of meeting him, he conned me into getting a bow. Now, remember, I'm a young kid. I've got a gun in my hand. I've shot deer, wounded them, and watched them run off with a load of buckshot in them. This guy's trying to talk me into shooting a deer with a stick, man. And I'm like, dude, you're smoking something. You know what I mean? What in the world, man? How are you going to kill this thing with a stick? Oh, you got to get your bow, son. Go get your bow. I'll set you up, teach you how to shoot it. Sure enough, I got to where I was pretty good with it. I could hit the paper. Uh, you know, and even his style of setting up a bow was anything like, nothing like anybody ever seen. He he made us literally practice from the tree, not from the ground. Set the bow up from the tree. He said, you're not shooting paper. This is not a tournament. You're, you're going to shoot. I'm going to teach you to shoot the way you're going to hunt. It's one thing to, to have a... 70 pound draw and you're pulling straight ahead and he said it's another thing to pull, put point the the bow at the deer and pull without any reflect no, no kind of motion just pull easily with ease and lock that bow you know it's just techniques like that 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 most guys think well let me go set my bow up let me shoot well he went a step further he took us and showed us the actual involvement it takes to draw that thing and him not see you when 89 i took a swing at it and i said okay I took a week off work, couldn't afford it, took a vacation, young, married, broke as a joke, got a brand new daughter, and uh, I said, I'm killing this deer if it's the last thing I do. So in 89 in the state of South Carolina, we had the Hurricane Hugo, came into Charleston Bay, came through Charleston into South Carolina, all the way up into Charlotte, North Carolina, and absolutely obliterated our state. So the trees and the style that he taught me to hunt, where trees would be dropping, you know, feed sign acorns and stuff, well, they're blown, you know, 100 yards away from a tree. It's, trees are, you couldn't walk 10 feet without stepping over humongous oak trees. So it literally destroyed our hunting property. Well, I was still hunting. I done took my vacation time. Three days have gone by. I have not jumped a deer. I have not seen a deer. I was convinced the hurricane sucked all of them out of here and killed them with trees falling. <laughs> there was no deer left in the state. This hurricane has killed every deer that is alive. So I called I called Sonny at the taxidermy shop about 12 o'clock one day. Me and my brother were hunting together. Uh, and I got a brother named Tim. Love both my brothers dearly. We hunted together all our life. And uh, we both called him and I said, look, we're going to pay for your gas. You got to get out here. The deer's dead. They're gone. That sort of hurricane sucked them out. And there, there are no more deer in, the, in America, I don't think. He laughed. He comes down. Now, this is roughly 100 acres in Chester County. He had never stepped foot on this property, so he didn't know anything about the land, the landscape, or nothing. He walks this property at 50, probably 52 years old, give or take. I'm guessing his age at that time. In 45 minutes, he walked it. He found me two spots to hunt. He found my brother two spots to hunt. And he said these words. He said, do not shoot that deer at 40, 30 yards. The deer is coming to you. You're going to shoot him at five yards or 10 yards. I can't believe you hadn't seen all this sign on the ground. I'm just looking at him. Like, what sign? You mean, I don't even know what you're talking about because it ain't, it's all tore up by the hurricane. He said, look at all this sign on the ground. He picks up an acorn. He said, he's going to hit, he's going to eat this acorn right here, and that's when you're going to shoot him. Throws it on the ground, walks off. In the next three days of that week, I have 39 deer under my tree stand, I never killed one of them because my nerves were shot and I couldn't pull the bow back. You don't talk about buck fever. I invented that word, man. I mean, I invented the word. I was shaking like a leaf. Things looking at you, man. They're five feet from you, nine at a time looking at you. It was the wildest thing I'd ever seen. I remember coming home every night telling, man, I seen three, I seen five, I seen nine, I seen ten. He's like, either you're going to kill her or I'm going to kill him. So just pull the bow, son, and shoot him, you know? And so that was my first experience with him. But you, you can't deny that. You walk a piece of property you've never been on in 45 minutes, and over the course of three days, there's 39 deer under your tree stand. I ain't talking about out there you see them. They're under your tree stand. And that was when I started learning the power of feed trees and natural sign and how deer gravitate to that when the, when, when the sign's on the ground, when the trees are right. They're going to gravitate to that thing like candy to a baby, man. There's no denying that. And we proved this, not in our state only, but in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama. You know, we've hunted everywhere. And this system works. There, it, it, it absolutely will work once you learn how it operates. 
Yeah, and one one other thing that there's there's a little more context I want to kind of give with this as well. You were talking about earlier on. Uh, I can't remember if it was Sonny or another gentleman did his own little personal study with um, buckets of like persimmons, white oaks, red oaks, and I think he even did corn as well to kind of see what the deer wanted yeah. to hit. Can you talk a little bit about that as well and kind of how that's kind of influenced you guys? Because South yeah. Carolina is a baiting state on private land. Yes. Yeah, so in our state, we can bait on private land. And back in those days, we could not bait. Now, the lower part of the state was strange. Half the state could bait, half the state could not. Sonny being a taxidermist, you know, he's the big outdoors guy. He, he had raised some deer. Uh, over a period of time, he had a pen there at his house, and farmers would, you know, find phones in the field bailing hay. They'd bring him a phone or something, you know, and now it's done been abandoned. And uh, so he, he would raise them. So over the years, he raised several. And this one deer he had, Bucky, uh, tremendous deer, probably a 130-inch deer. Uh, he's probably 200 pound plus. He would test this deer with five buckets of feed. And so in one bucket, he would have persimmons. And another bucket, he would have white oaks. And another bucket, he'd have red oaks. And another bucket, pin oaks or water oaks, we call them. And then another bucket, he would have corn. He would, you know, whistle at Bucky or whatever. He would walk up there and literally stick his nose in that persimmon tree bucket. And when he did start eating them, he'd reach in there and take the bucket out. Now, we're talking about during hunting season with a full set of horns on his head. You know, not quite in the rut yet because he was really hard to control once he got there. But you could get in there and interact with him. And then, you know, he would take that bucket out, and the next thing would be acorns. It'd be, and it would start with white oak acorns. And he'd say, now watch this, son. He's telling you what he likes to eat the most. And he said, now, I'm not coaching him to do this. He's just going to tell you what he wants. He'd take white oaks out, then he'd go to red oaks. He'd take the red oak bucket out, and he'd go to pin oaks. And the last thing he got was corn. And I know everybody's on that, and I'm not against it. I'm just saying it has its place. But I'm telling you, if that mass crop of acorns is on your property or in that vicinity where you are, you can bait all you want until it's got, and they will sporadically still come to it. But the bulk of your deer are going to be on that mass crop that's naturally given by God. I mean, I, I, tell me what it is, but it's, it is candy to them guys, man. I, I've tested it. You know, in North Carolina, we can bait too, and I've hunted North Carolina quite a bit because we're on the state line. My dad uh, lived in Charlotte, and he had uh, property in North Carolina in different areas. And so they could bait as well. And we would sit there and set up timing corn feeders. And all of a sudden, they're eating 200 pounds a week, mass crop, acres start falling, and the corn's laying on the ground, and the raccoons is eating it. Same deer, same spot. Nobody's messed with them. They just shift. They just change like that. And a lot of times people think, oh, they're moving at night or I'm not seeing them for some reason. What it is, they're, have, they, they've got to eat. And there again, that was Sonny's policy was you can hunt the rut and you should. And there's a way to do that. But that deer's got to eat. Now, he may back off of his food as much when he's in rut. But guess what he's after? The does. And the does are not in rut. They're going to eat. So as those you're finding the feed source where these does are, the traffic's going to be there. Then it's a matter of patience and a waiting game to kill the big boy because they're going to be in their feeding constantly when you find the correct feed source and how that works. And so that was his mindset. Now, we also are a state that is a timberland state. So we got a lot of timber property. Alabama's got the same. Uh, he was a big guy, a big advocate of, of clear-cut hunting. I was the same way. I still am today. Um, if a clear cut gets two to three years, a big deer cannot see past his eyes. And so he's thinking he's secluded and you're jacked up 20 feet above that looking down in it. And your traffic margin is a lot higher and you can see a lot further. And so a lot of the state records he killed was in big clear cuts like that for rifles and things. But we were able to kill, if I'm not mistaken, our bag limit was 13 or 14. And during bow season, we could kill seven or eight. And during that bow season, he would tag out every year seven or eight in two weeks with a bow. And that was consistent. And like I was saying to you guys earlier, I think it's one thing for somebody to kill a deer with a bow, kill a nice deer with a bow. And it's another thing to be consistent with it, that your system you're using produces results every single year if the crop value is there and everything works out right. 
and Rick, when you said you know he'd kill seven or so in the first two weeks, uh, you're talking about bucks. You're not talking about does, correct? Yeah. Well, it depends. He would take some does out, but he he was also like this. Come December, it's a bad day on some does. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but first part of the year, he's going to be selective about what he's shooting because he knows what's in the area. So toward the end of the year, he's just going to start. Let's get these does out of here. Let's start controlling this herd. He'd bring friends in, kids in. Let's get these does thinned down. He just wouldn't do it early in the season as much as he would in December. And if you talk to the biologist, they'll recommend you do it in December because they've already been bred many times, and you're getting more out of the herd than than just taking one doe if they've already been bred. And so a lot of them are favored for that. Now, Rick, I want to kind of dive in a little bit more about, the, you know, of course, with feed trees and the success that you guys have over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, one thing I want to talk about real early, I want to get your take on this. What is one of the biggest factors that you've learned when it came to woodsmanship and hunting feed trees that is just invaluable, as in, like, this is like a must-do, must-thing that you have to learn in order to be successful when it comes to feed trees? Okay, when we use the term feed trees, let's get specific here for just a moment. So you have white oaks, red oaks, pin oaks. Well, there's no corn growing on a tree. So let's just take that and set it all to the side. Some states can bait, some states cannot. So deer are natural uh, creatures of what we call creatures of the edge. They walk the edge of a cutover. They walk, watch the edge of a pine thicket. They're, they're just creatures of the edge. So Sonny is going to, if he's sitting here today, and, and if I'm teaching some of my kids and different people, we're going to say this, we're going to start at the thickest part of our property because that's where the bedding is. And it could be a cutover that borders some hardwoods. It could be a thicket that borders some hardwoods. We're going to find out kind of where the bedding area is. And we're going to walk inside, say, the whole line. I'm going to walk the line, and I'm looking for the first trees that's dropping because that's what he's going to hit. He's going to come out of his bed. He's going to pick up on the first feed trees that's dropping. We're going to drop back 20, 30 yards, and we're going to start doing a checkerboard. As we're walking through, we're going to be zigzagging back and forth. But one of the key elements to finding that early in the year is a pair of binoculars. You can stand up on a ridge side and look across a hillside and see trees that start to sag. You can see white oak trees that are just heavy loaded or red oak trees that are heavy loaded. And mass crop is strange. They say there's a formula. I don't know. Sometimes it is. There's not a formula to how they offset the crop. Some years it's white oak, some years it's red oak, some years it's both. Some years it's none. To be honest with you, the easier hunting is when it's none. You get all that stuff fa falling at one time, oh, it, you fix it, you fix to lose some weight, but it ain't no diet program. You got to do a lot of walking to <laughs> narrow him down because there's so much there's so much food, man. There's so much food, you know what I mean? So so when the crop is alternating we already know they prefer white oaks over red oaks. They're going to do both, but they prefer them over that. And I know after I'm walking, the first 10 minutes I'm walking, I'm saying, okay, well, there's there's a white oak crop this year, and it looks pretty good. So I'm going to start really – I'm going to look for red oaks as I'm moving, but I'm looking for them white oaks. Well, the second factor is – and this was strange. A lot of guys hunt rub lines and stuff like that. <laughs> I've proven this probably over the last – five or six years with some new guys and i said just go see if it works I i've just noticed this but see if it works if you're early in the season and he's in there knocking that velvet off his horns and he's just kind of marking some territory he ain't really blistering the place he's just marking some territory he's marking it because the does are in there watch this you take a rub and you walk 50 yards around that rub in a complete circle and you're going to find a feed tree within 50 yards of that rub that's almost a given it's the strangest thing I've ever thought. And I started paying attention to it probably later on in life that I would notice early in the season. I'm talking about right there around September. They start knocking it off and the acorns start falling. You find that rub and walk, walk a 50 yard circle around it within, within a bow shot really. And you're going to find some tree right in there somewhere where they're just, these does are tearing this thing up in here. Now here's a, a philosophy we use this almost that's almost flawless. This this is a flawless fact. <laughs> I'm going to be discreet. You're going to eat and you're going to go to the bathroom, right? They do the same thing. Sonny, Sonny literally taught me. He said, you're going to look for the droppings on this deer. You find a tree. You say, man, this is a great tree. 
how do I know it's the good tree? Well, it, you know, they're pawing the ground up, but I'm looking for droppings. And I'm not looking for just droppings. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for old and new. Old means he was there. New means he's coming back. I want them slick with the steam coming off of them. But I also want it old. This deer's on a pattern. He's on a pattern coming. These does are coming in there. Look around, find a rub around that thing. But, and, and what you do is early in the season, you got to plant that tree in the back of your head and say, okay, I know where that's at. But you keep walking. And you you do this, say, two weeks coming into the season. This is a, this is a must do. You walk it, you mark them in the back of your head, and we scout in the middle of the day. We do not scout in the morning. We do not scout in the evening. The less scent we have in there, the better. We walk in, we check the property, we get out. So we walk in and we find where they're hitting at and we get out of there. So I'm gonna come back about a week before season. And I'm gonna, now the only thing I'm gonna do is go to the trees that I found. I'm not gonna walk the whole property because two days before the season comes in, I'm going to make up my mind. Out of those five spots that I found that had the most droppings, the most sign, I'm going to make up my mind within the last two days. And I grant you, if the moon phase is correct and it's not a full moon and they're not in there on a full moon and the moon phase is correct, there is a cycle that's going to happen between that moon and their feeding on that tree. And it is deadlier than the Terminator of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> now, am I am I going to am I going to guarantee you it's a record class deer? No. This is about learning deer, where they feed, the does are in there, and the bucks are gonna be with them. Now, here early part of the year, they're in bachelor groups, and 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 I'll be honest with you, I've had as many as seven bucks under my tree. We can kill two in a day, and I've killed two with a bow in the same afternoon. I mean the same set. One shoot one, turn around, shoot the other. There's that many here in there, especially if I don't have a lot of time to hunt and I got to make the best of what I've got. But that combination of droppings on that tree, knowing which tree to which, and marking that in the back of your head. And here's the key factor: a lot of guys don't bow hunt, especially. This is their living room. So if you get in there. And you say, man, I like this place, and I'm going to set up with a blind. Uh, you're probably done. You're probably done. It's almost like you coming home and somebody's turned over your furniture. Sonny ain't going to allow that. So we use strictly climbing stands. I know that don't fit a lot of guys' stuff because it's, it's difficult, and I'm not against it. I'm just saying you set something up where they're feeding heavy, they ain't coming back. And so from that point, we try not to limb as much as we can. And if we do, we carry the limbs out of there completely away. We go in the middle of the day, we cut a few limbs, and we're going to drag 200 yards out of there just so he don't see them laying. You don't, you don't want to mess up his living room because they're in there feeding like, like crazy. And so that's a, the technique and the style of once you find that spot. But those feed trees are the, are the key to it all. you got to learn which, what they feed. You walk your property, you know your property, but just don't go hammering through there. You gotta go midday sometime. If y'all today you got Saturday, go at, go at 12 o'clock. I ain't gonna take you go on Sunday cause I'm a pastor, okay? But if you gonna go on Sunday, you go after church on Sunday and grab you a sandwich, buddy, and hit the woods and go scouting, okay? So, but do it midday whenever you do it when you can, and it's just gonna keep you sent down. Sonny was an advocate. You know, we're gonna go in here, we're going to look, find what we're looking for, and we're getting out of here. A week later, we're going to come back, and we're going to check those same five trees we found. Probably only a day or so, you'll walk the bulk of your property just to kind of see what's going on. But once you hammer down, i got acorns on the ground. i got deer droppings all over the place. There's a rub over here. That's in my head, and I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to come back a week, and three days, I'm hanging a stand. And I promise you, something's going to be ground round. I can promise you that. If I want to pull the trigger, Rick, that we're about to go so far down this rabbit hole. Like, I, but I want to start by backing up a little bit and setting the the groundwork a little bit more on the kind of stuff that you're actually hunting. So I'm curious about what is the terrain like? Is it flat or is it hilly? And then also, what is the habitat like? You mentioned it's timber country. 
are you dealing with hunting hardwoods and little SMZs, or do you have larger tracks of hardwoods, like you know, like maybe rolling hardwoods or something like that? So our region is more rolling. It's not. It's not hill country. So we have the foothills of the Carolinas, but we're kind of like it can be flat and it can be hilly. It's just, but it's not mountainous terrain. It's not none of that. Uh, you guys got some pretty good sized mountains up around the Silicaga area, stuff like that. I'm thinking more like Auburn, you know, for y'all, where it's more kind of flat, but yet can roll. It can roll, you mean? And don't get me wrong, we can get a few little areas around here to get real hilly, but not bad. Uh, we are timber country, but remember this about the guys that are in timber country. There is a law, and this is also killer, man. There's a law that the timber companies cannot cut within so many feet of a creek on any creek, any water frontage. Therefore, they leave all that standing timber, which is hardwoods. And if they, if it's all pines, man, there's going to be there's going to be acres down on that creek somewhere. And so, that a lot of times, if it's pure timber country, that's fine. But we're down on the creek beds, looking where they had to leave the timber. You know, saying we're looking at those funnels and draws through there, where they've had to leave the timber to find the correct acres and stuff like that. But there are many times there. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to dispute. There's a lot of tracts of land that the timber companies. This is all they have. And it's just a different style of hunting. So you have to rely more or less on baiting early because there's no, they cut everything. Uh, and then get into gun season and take advantage of a clear cut and you subject kill some monsters during gun season as far as in that clear cut itself. You know what I'm saying? It's just the way it runs. Um, but I would say that for the most part, if they have acorns in that region anywhere, and I've always said this too, the less, the better. The less there is, the less walking I've got to do and the further they're going to come to get them. And so if they got little Island pockets of hardwoods here and there, little Island pockets and stuff, man, that's some killer stuff. Uh, it's just, the main thing is, is getting in there and getting out of there, you know, uh, without being seen, without disturbing too much and, uh, and keeping your scent right. I mean, of course we all know sense everything, but of course we got something for that too, but yeah, we're we're gonna get into the scent stuff for sure. Um, the 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 feed tree thing, man. This is a this is an excellent subject because we're heading right into deer season, pretty much across the whole southeast at the time this drops. We're recording this on August first, uh, so over the next I don't know month and a half, two months, w when are you gonna start actually going out there? Like, give me some dates. Like, when are the acorns gonna start dropping? When are you looking for them? And and like, what is your circuit gonna be like? Well, in our part of the region, God doesn't turn air condition on to November, okay? <laughs> and August, August is terrible. And if I went today, August the 1st, we don't hunt August 15th. The lower part of our state does. Now, I got a bunch of friends that hunt down there. Most of that stuff is big green fields, uh, corn feeders and stuff like that. And it's very successful. And it's rifle hunting. Remember, that is an open season of whatever you want to use. Gun, rifle, bow, shotgun, slingshot, whatever you want to use. We are pinned down to the September 15th range. I'm going to really look, start, and remember in our region too, the upper part of South Carolina, acorns are generally, they could cut loose. Oh, I want to hit this too. They could cut loose on September 15th, but for the most part, they just start getting active. So they'll start dropping a little bit September 15th because that two-week period between September 15th and October 1st, there's, in nature, there's a lot of stuff God is doing. Those things are starting to release, and by October 1st, they're really starting to get a steady drop on the ground because what happens around September 15th, you got them little tree rats running around, and they're going to start knocking them out whether they're ready to fall or not. Well, the deer, the deer start picking up on that, which is, the, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but I listen to the tree rats. You get a tree rat and he starts knocking stuff out of a tree and I've literally watched deer pick their head up and walk over there because they can hear him falling. So when the squirrels start knocking them out, the deer find them. If the deer find them enough of them, they'll start creating a pattern to that tree. Your job is to walk in there, don't touch nothing. And when it starts looking like a herd of hogs went underneath it and there's droppings all over the place, and you can see where this ain't squirrels tearing this up. This is deer. This is absolute deer. It's old and new sign. Then, then I'm going to ease on. But you're coming into a bow season 
that it's before the way we started back in the eighties. It's, 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 it's earlier. So I've got to, I've got to adapt to that to answer your question. I'm going to hit the woods around September 1st. I'm going to hit the woods and I'm going to have a pair of binoculars in my hand. Binoculars just stops me from walking as much, or it can help me to walk because I can look out across there and see trees that's kind of hanging. They're not ready to, they're not dropping yet, but they're weighted. And I can say that tree's loaded over there. I'm going to go check it out. And I can go there and look underneath it, see a squirrel's been knocking things out. You know, I'm leading up to this two week period. Um, but if, you know, if they don't have the acres, they want to start baiting. Of course, that's true. But I, if I'm looking for sign and to show you how powerful this still is. Now, I'm a pastor. Uh, my schedule is absolutely crazy. Uh, I travel international. And so for me to get in the woods now, sometimes it's a really hard old deal. So when I do get a window to go, I'm gone. I mean, I'm, I might have an hour in the afternoon, a couple hours. I got a brand new piece of property. Uh, two years ago that I've never hunted. Uh, the farmer says, Hey, go on in there, hunt pasture. You good to go. I grabbed my boat and took off. I made a 200 yard stretch, found one feed tree, went up. I got seven bucks under my tree and I killed one about 18 inches wide. The first day I had my bow in my hand was the same day that I walked in the woods, not scouting and coming back. I was late getting in there and I just found where they were just tearing this thing up. Just like I'm talking about droppings was everywhere. And that key to this thing is droppings. They got to remember, uh, uh, he can eat and move on. A lot of stuff can tear the ground up, but them droppings tells you this is a deer. And this is where he was here a week ago. And he's back yesterday and on and on and on. And you'll see that all around the base of those trees hanging out through there. And if I go in September the 1st, in my case, I want to be a few weeks early. I don't, I don't necessarily, and Sonny never did either. We don't scout year round. What we do is we prepare year round for say, man, you know, this area produces well. So let me go in here in the summertime with my limb saw and let me, let me just clean up some of these stuff to send my shooting way before the acorns hit the ground. You, you follow what I'm saying? If we don't go in there when we find the place and clean it up. We know that area tends to do well, so we'll go in there and clean it up and get it ready. But that's early on, like this time of year or earlier, and especially in the wintertime. You can go in there when season ends and say, man, this was a great area. That tree, I had one tree in particular, for some reason, it would produce every year almost. I killed a lot of deer in this tree. And so what I've done is everything that was in my shooting way, as soon as season went out, I went in and clipped it down. But, man, I'm not going in his living room when he's in there living. You know what I mean? I, I'm not doing that. You know I mean, and so it's just a few techniques that's going to enhance your ability to be more uh, successful. If you think like he thinks, you got to think like that deer thinks, and especially how they eat. Uh, a lot of guys going to get into the rut. That's a whole nother ball game. Um, I am a big moon hunter. I have proven it, tested it. If and and if your viewers want a book, it's the only book I've ever saw that literally mirrored sunny style from another state. Uh, and, and a friend of mine was a big moon hunter. I never was. I started timing the moon by the feed trees and it was deadly. See, Sonny could tell you where he couldn't tell you when that moon tells you when the feed trees tell you where you combine the where and the when, and it's over, bro. I'm just telling you it's a, let me just say it like this. My buddy and me killed 22 deer with a bow my last year hunting. 22 with a bow in the state of South Carolina, my last year hunting. And I say, I hunt now, but I'm talking when I really hunted before pastoring and Baptist people got in my way. But anyway, <laughs> everybody got to have a job, you know what I mean? So, but anyway, 22, we felt, I, he would shoot and I'd film, he'd, I'd film, hit you, kind of like you two guys. That's what we do. We'd have, we had a ball doing all this. But that's how accurate the system was. But this is the year we found out how the moon worked with this whole feeding chart. Sonny never could figure that part out. He would say, they're going to be here. I just can't tell you when. Well, when we started combining this whole moon thing, and the book is called Moonstruck by Jeff Murray. Jeff Murray was a writer for Field and Stream, Outdoor Channel, all these guys. He was one of the leading readers. I think he was a biologist, if I'm not mistaken. 
But Jeff was one of the leading people in America to start studying moon phases. And his book, Moonstruck, is still available today on Amazon. And I got it because my buddy, he had killed, gosh, man, he had 25 state records in our state. And I thought either this guy's the biggest poacher I've ever seen in modern time, or he's on to something. And he would he would fast he would fixate his hunting every two weeks on a cycle. Uh, but he wasn't pulling the trigger list that was going on the wall. Um, he would hunt places nobody hunted, very strategic, but he was always about the moon. So I called Jeff Murray when I got the book. He was in Michigan, and I said, Jeff, I said, uh, look, man, I'm really intrigued about what I'm reading. He said, well, what are you seeing? I said, well, you know, I'm taking, when you're saying the moon's right, I'm checking that. according, And I see deer, I kill deer, but I have never looked at the timing of it. And he said, what is your percentage? I said, "About that thing's about 80% right. He said, that's about what we get. He said, nothing's 100%. I said, but it's about 80% right. So when we started combining Jeff Murray's tactic to this same thing, it was double trouble after that. Uh, nothing's 100%. All kinds of things can happen. Weather's a factor. Fronts are a factor. A lot of those things are a factor. We did learn about feed trees, that when a front is moving in, get in the woods. If a front's moving out, get in the woods. Go to those places to hunt because deer – take an urge to feed on those trees as a big storm is coming in because they don't know how long they're going to be down. So they'll take an urge to get in there and feed as much. And you, that's why you see all that movement before a front like that because they're going to go bed down after that because they don't know if they're going to be down for a week or a day or two. So they're going to fill up as much as they can. And they just take an urge to feed. I do take within about two to three weeks of season, I'm going to hit the woods and I got my snake boots on and I'm going to do some walking. And I just basically want to see what's on my property. I want to see, do we have any acorns this year? You know, there's been years, it's been very little. Um, there was a season with a feed tree that blew my mind. I'm hunting of all places in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the city, urban warfare. And I got permission from a customer of mine back when I was in the plumbing business to hunt a 50 acre tract of land that had a soybean field on it, surrounded by subdivisions. This is how powerful this is. I asked the guy, I took some off the bill to give me the hunting rights. And he was gracious enough to do that. He said, they're eating up all my soybeans. Just go get them, man. And of course, in North Carolina, we can only bow hunt, and uh, which is perfect for me. Sure enough, I go in there and I see 20 bucks. Got them on camera film, 20 bucks in one screen. One of them looks like the Hartford elk. He's probably one of the biggest deer I've ever got on film. I had set my mind to kill this deer. Well, I would go after work. It was on my way home. I, I did not have to go in the field. I set me up a little blind almost in his yard so I could film where they were coming out from and seeing what was there. I had this young group of teenage deer, I called them, bucks. And then I had the senior citizens. These were all sevens, eights, nines, and this big 10 I was hunting. And all of a sudden, one day, you know, he this this big deer ran with several other big deer early in the season well he didn't show up but the other deer was there so i walked out in the field and ran them off and this field was like a horseshoe that come around to one highway so you can see it right here go past the house and see it again i walk around there and the hartford elks down there posing for the city of charlotte five o'clock traffic people are stopped everywhere looking at him on the side of the road i said somebody's going to shoot him out of the window i went and ran him off well, I started baiting this deer in the middle of the horseshoe where nobody could see him back in there. Perfect. Here they come. They're feeding. To, I'm just counting the days down. He's on the wall. I done had the mount picked out. I done named him Boo Boo. I mean, I got him, Bo. I got him. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, this is this is vital. All of a sudden, let's see. Now, North Carolina seasons that time came in September the first. All of a sudden, this deer is gone, and he ain't only gone, all of them's gone, but two or three stragglers. For a week, I could not find him. I said, what in the world? Well, he's coming out of a very thick area, and I didn't want to go back in there and mess with him. I didn't really have to go in there. He's coming out. I ain't got to go in there and mess with him. Well, I got so frustrated. My buddy that's hunting with me says, man, let's go in there and find him. I said, no, he's he's winning there for some reason. I don't know where they went. This is almost, you got soybeans, which they love, 
and corn, why would he leave this? And there's all pine thicket he's coming out of. I go to a property two miles down the road where we got a time and corn feeder in North Carolina. Walk down in there, and corn is laying everywhere, and deer start blowing. And my buddy said, well, they were coming in. I said, no, 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 let's walk down there. Sure enough, we walked down there, and the feed trees started cutting loose early in the year. I said, I cannot believe this is in September. We're talking about the last couple of days of August into September. I said, and that crazy rascal has went back in there somewhere, and there's some acorns back in there somewhere. I said, what it is, there, he's left this corn because these acorns are on the ground. Well, I, I figured this out. It's happened to me four or five times. If we have a dry summer, and maybe biologists can speak into this, if we have a drought summer, dry summer, they turn loose early. Now, I'm not a biologist. I'm not an arborist. I don't know. But I will say that that taught us a valuable lesson. So sure enough, we walked back in there, and there were housing developments in there with all these acre trees. And guess what he did? He moved in under somebody's porch, and I never did kill him. And he stayed there. Because those acorns cut loose early, and he left soybeans, which is low part of South Carolina. This time of year, they're planting down there, all that stuff. And he left corn. To go get them acorns, an eighth of a mile back in there, he walked out of there. So they will leave any predominant, I call it man-made fixture sometimes, to go to nature's best that God gave them. You know? And that's those feed trees, man. It's, it's insane how it works. Man, there's there's like an unbelievable amount there that we need to talk about. But one thing I really want to ask you about, uh, especially with that last story, that that big buck in that pine thicket, uh, when it just to kind of reel it back a little bit, when it comes to going and finding these feed trees, and maybe you're looking in SMZs, maybe you're looking down, you know, like behind a housing development, like you're just talking about, or when you're going to look for these feed trees and you're going to walk a property. How much of a relation to bedding cover are you are you looking for? Like, are you looking for an SMZ that's got great bedding cover, like right above it, right there? Or maybe it's like mediocre bedding cover, and you're just mainly just focused on the trees, and you don't necessarily need a, a super thick thicket, uh, you know, 80 yards away through the woods? I, I basically don't harness my energy as to where they're bedding at all. I need to kind of mentally know that, you know, that I know they're bedding over that way somewhere or whatever, but I'm not even looking for their bedding. They're going to bed where they're going to bed. And many times, if you've got a bunch of property that's wide open hardwoods, they're going to bed underneath the trees themselves. You'll see beds under there where they've been eating and just laying down. I've had them lay down underneath me while we're sitting there hunting. So they're going to rest and bed where they do. I don't necessarily go looking for thickets and stuff. But I know by looking at a topographical or looking at something, okay, you know, it's pretty thick over here, and that's where they're going to be bedding at. But over here is my hardwoods, and so I'm going to I'm gonna stay away from that anyway. But, and they could come out of there. They could come from somewhere else. And see, that was Sonny's thing. I say, Sonny, man, look at this trail. Look at this trail. And he'd look at me and say, do you know how many trails, son, are in these woods? Do you know how many trails are in these woods? And I say, yeah, I mean, but look at this one. No, uh-uh. Them trails are going somewhere, and we are going where he is going. He is going to this tree, son, and he could use one of 50 trails to get there out of a bed in this way, a bed in that way. It don't matter. He's coming to this tree. It's crazy how it sounds, but he's right. They got to eat, and they can come from this bed or that bed they're coming into that focused harness area. You know, what's really strange is I had a funeral of a dear friend um, that was raised with us and Sonny actually taught this young man the taxidermist trade before he passed away. And we all met up at the funeral and we got us a picture there. And I was sitting there looking at these guys that he taught with me. And I went, man, Every one of these guys are skilled hunters, man. I mean, and we were all teenagers. We were just kids, you know, when he when he invested in us. And uh, but to know that it wasn't just me, his tactic worked across the board with anybody that was willing to just invest a little time and learn and walk and go go look at your property. 
Uh, try not to be a sluggard and lazy as far as your hunting tag. Just get out there and enjoy the woods. Walk. See what you got. And once you learn that system, it would pay off. You know, it didn't matter if I was in Alabama. It didn't matter if I was in Georgia, you know. Um, I used some of the same tactics. Uh, I've hunted Illinois many times, and um, and I've had great success in Illinois. Uh, but the, 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 the scent cover we use is different there. But as far as anything else, because uh, the tactics of how they feed is the same. The moon face works there, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they have a corn mass crop. You know, they don't have acorn mass crop. They got this mass corn population out there. So those kind of guys that are listening from those regions could have a different take on this. And, and I totally agree with that because it is a little different. We're talking about South Carolina, North Carolina, this part of the region, Georgia. This is a proven tactic. And if you can learn that tree, you find the sign, he's going to he's gonna sleep. He's going to eat, sleep. And he's going to breed. That's what they're going to do. But we focused our energy. Where does that deer eat? Where's them does going to eat at? Because he's coming. He's absolutely, give him time. He's going to run with the girls and he's coming. And you just got to be patient at that point. If you want to shoot the does, shoot the does. I'm all for that too. But if you want to kill a big deer, it's just a matter of patience. And uh, I've always said this, every state's got their deal, but a deer does not, get to be any kind of record book if he's a year and a half old okay he's got to live to grow so you got to let him walk let him live and you know start managing some and and you'll have some great success so there um the feed tree thing is is a really awesome subject i feel like especially for southerners because a lot of times we kind of get drawn into the bedding talk and and that's like kind of a sexy subject for a lot of people but in a place where you're hunting timber country and the bedding is really everywhere it's like well which one is really like your more of like your point that you can focus on you know he's not limited to one point like maybe in a place like wisconsin where there's a you know 15 acre wood block in the you know a sea of cornfields or whatever where maybe there is only one place where he can really bed it's not like that here. He can kind of bet anywhere like you're talking about. And so that, that point source becomes your feed tree. Like that's the point that you can really nail him down to. And he can come from wherever. And that kind of brings me to my question about you, you mentioned that when you find a feed tree, w when you know whether or not that feed tree is worth hunting is, is based on the pawn on the ground, old and fresh scat, and I'm assuming also buck sign around that tree. When you find that tree, how do you go about – I mean, do you go about trying to backtrack those deer uh, to, to kind of figure out a general direction that they're coming from? Or are you, you're you only worried about no. that tree and just setting up on that tree? Here's what I'm trying to do. Back in the day, Sonny would say, at all possible, get in the very tree that he's feeding on. Get in that tree. Because most of my shots are going to be almost straight down with a boat. Mm-hmm. At least I'm going to be looking at the closest climbable tree around that tree. But which way he's coming from, I'm not even going to try to determine it. I have missed that a thousand times. Now, what I haven't missed is the fact he's going to be there. I just have to be ready when he gets there. He could come in behind me. He could come in from the front. Depending on what his day's like, I guess. You know what I'm saying? He could be out walking and make a turn somewhere before he comes in there. I know there's like, for instance, uh, one of my favorite ways to hunt in South Carolina is if there is clear-cut property that's bordered by hardwoods because i know predominantly he's probably bedding out in that cut over somewhere and he's going to he's going to start feeding on the first trees available that start falling that's how he finds them and i'll get right inside of that wood line somewhere on the on the best tree that's hottest and i'll kind of face the fact that i know he's possibly coming from that way but i have missed it and four come from behind me you know what I mean to the same tree I know I'm in the right spot. I just can't really determine which way he's going to come. Now, a lot of people will say wind's a factor. You know, he'll play the wind and come in downwind, stuff like that. And I agree. I mean, there's a lot of times they do that. But the main thing is if you have your stuff right uh, and your sense covered, all that stuff is right, it's really not going to matter. And as strange as it sounds, I worry more about the deer seeing me than I do smelling me when I go to draw that boat. I, I worry more about him, all that motion up in that tree. And so I'm a big advocate. You, I've got to get high enough or in a, in a, in a pattern way where he cannot visibly see me moving at all. 
I don't want to be straining with a bow. I want to be smooth with that action and pull that action back with a weight, a bow weight that I can control. Um, but yeah, the direction he's coming, that that you know, and I don't really focus a lot on that. Once I once I have hammered down out of five trees, I've got three that's hot as a firecracker. It's just a matter which one I'm going to hunt first. Um, here's another thing that I do. If I if I have four trees on my property, and let's just use a 50 acre track or a 100 acre track, and I find three feed trees on that property, and I'm going to get to hunt opening day, which is a rare thing for me to do, but I'm going to get to hunt opening day. If I shoot, miss, kill, or wound on opening day on that tree, I do not come back and hunt that tree the next day. If I sling an arrow on that tree, I have just told them all, I have just moved into your house. I'm going to go to the next tree that's the hottest the next time I get to go. Let's say I take a week off to hunt. I'm going to hunt here. If I shoot, kill, miss, whatever, the next day I'm going to be on that other tree. And the third day I'm going to be on the third tree. If I shoot. If I don't shoot, I'm going to stay there. At least under the couple of days we were going on. You follow what I'm doing and watch this. I have done this and proven this, that by the time I make myself back to where I first shot, that tree has cooled down. Their nerves have gotten settled down and they're back in there like normal. Then it's the element of surprise again. And bow hunting, most of the time, I would say is extremely the element of surprise. He doesn't know you're there. Your first day shooting is going to be your best. After that, it's going to be hit or miss once you start shooting. But it's always the element of surprise in bow hunting. With a gun, he's 200 yards. You got a 270, 300, whatever. He don't even know where it come from. You know what I mean? But with a bow, you right on top of you, and it's good to have a versatile place to go to. And Sonny would say, "You shoot here. Don't go back there. Give it time to cool down. Let's let's go hunt this other spot." I said, "But man, that thing's hot. I seen another big old deer. I'm gonna go back in there." He said, "Nah, he ain't going nowhere." He's coming right here to feed. It ain't the rut yet. He ain't in the next state. It's early in the season. He's still going to come back. Let's go to this other tree and hunt. Let's go to this other tree and hunt. And we keep making our way back around. And within a day or two or three, we'll come back. And we'll see if he shows back up in here. Because especially if you spook him or something like that, you got to let it calm down. If you if you get busted in there, then I don't come back. I'll go somewhere else and let it all settle back down. Because you know how they are. Them jerkers can see you in a tree, look at you, stomp at you, and act the fool, especially them big, wise does. You know, I want to shoot all them with a cannon. And, and I worry more about a big doe than I do a buck. I want to take a hand grenade and kill all them does that's about 60 years old, got ears long as an elephant. I want to kill all them things. You know what I mean? They're wisest thing in the wood. That's the smartest joker ever lived God put on the planet. So j- just to hammer home the the – the sign reading specifically around feed trees. Let's say that you're wanting to exclusively target bucks. Like you're going out and you really don't care about shooting does early and you just want to kill a nice buck on a feed tree. In addition to the droppings and everything, what are you are you wanting to see any kind of other buck sign there, like a consistency of rubs, like old rubs, new rubs? And then also on that same vein, how long are you seeing these spots stay good? Like when you find a hot tree, how long do you have before it goes cold? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's really, remember now, you're talking early part of the year. So it's hard hard to look at buck sign and judge the size of a deer. I have literally had small trees rubbed on a feed tree, and that turn, there's a 16, 17-inch eight-point standing on it. And I'm thinking, I didn't see that coming. I'm thinking, it's going to be like a four-point. Well, what it is, he's not really tearing the woods up yet to hit real big trees, make real big pole places, that kind of thing. But that tree is going to stay hot as a firecracker until them acorns are gone. Other deer is going to use it. Other deer is going to come in there. And especially if you get in there and you start seeing paw places early in the year around that tree, it's going to be on, man. And, it, and it's not going to leave, really. I mean, it's not going to be – how do you say this? So, Because most guys don't strictly bow hunt. They're going to transition to gun hunting. So they're getting in there on those feed trees during bow season, but when gun season, they're going to back off that tree and like cover the whole ridge with a rifle or something. You know what I mean? Well, that same sense, there's something about, I've watched them through the woods. Uh, they'll, they'll be feeding, and he told me to watch out for this. He said, watch it. 
he's eating on that tree over there and eating on that tree and feeding, feeding, feeding. All of a sudden, he's you. I said, what is it? He said, they have what we call, and, and excuse me, uh, Jeff Murray spoke into this in his book. They have secondary feeding spots, and then they have primaries. That primary is what you're looking for. There will be other trees. There will be other stuff. And you're allowed to find a tree that's got some a, a dropping or so, like fresh droppings on it. If I find a tree that's got fresh droppings on it, I'll think about it, keep it in the back of my head. If I don't find nothing better, I'll come back and hunt it. But I'm really looking for a combination of about three things a sign around that tree. Droppings, primarily. Fresh and old, primarily. The ground tore up like a like a hog went under. Now, when they first find it, it's not going to be quite like that, just the more they use it, okay? Another thing, if it's a dry week and you're scouting, the sign is not going to be as in your face. It will, but not as in your face. But if it rains, and within a day of that rain or two days of that rain, you go back in there and check it. And I'm telling you, it's going to look, it look like a totally different tree when really it's the same sign. It's just dry. And you can't you can't really see the, the 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 fingerprints, if you will, of what's happening around that thing. But I try to go in and harness my industry between droppings, uh, digging and pawing, a rub within fifty yards of that thing, a paw place within fifty yards of that thing. Um, and if I can catch that combination, it ain't that I'm dead set because I don't want to be dead set till I walk my property. And then once I've covered the ground, I'll say, you know what? Out of all the spots I found, that spot has got the four key elements on it. And I'm coming back next week, and I'm checking that tree, that tree, that tree, and that tree. Then I'm three days from hunting seeds, and I'm going to check that tree, that tree, that tree, that tree. And I have made up my decision because, remember, the sign is still building because the acres are getting better. The closer it gets on in the season, the more acres are falling, and the more deer that's in there following them other deer – and you liable to walk into the biggest feeding frenzy you've ever seen in your life. You know, most guys have never hunted with a bow and had 10 or 15, 11 or 9 or 6 deer under them at one time. That's a nerve-wracking thing. I don't even like that because I got 20 sets of eyes, 20 ears, and any move I make's like, you know, they got me pinned to the wall, you know. It's hard to move in that kind of atmosphere, but that's what this tree's done. These trees have the power to draw that kind of deer in there once they start putting them off. And I thought about it over the years off and on that, you know, they've been eating briars all summer. You know, they eating grass, they eating tree leaves, and all of a sudden you just go out there and you just gave everybody an ice cream. They coming, brother. Free ice cream. They coming. And that's pretty much, I think, what it sucks them in is just that, that change in their appetite, and it's so good that they can't they can't resist it. They coming in there, you know what I mean? So uh, if that helps you with what you're looking for, there's about three key elements I'm going to harness in on: droppings, sign pawing, a rub here, a scrape there, something in close pro. And I'm and always remember, I'm not hunting the scrape, and I'm not hunting the rub. You cannot tell in the early season if that's a spike. Or if he's a 140 inch deer, because he could be either one in the early season. He's just knocking their velvet off his horns right now. He ain't really ripping up the world. You give him about October 1st and you can start telling what's happening. You give about middle October and then, oh yeah, yeah, that's terrible. You mean it'll like a, a track, trailer truck ran through there. But but it's build, that sign is building and you're moving with it. You're just moving with it as they move. Uh, and remember, if you blow it up and you mess it up and it ain't the end of the world, they just going to feed somewhere else, and you just got to keep looking where that's at. Okay. Now, what gives you the confidence that when you find all that feed sign, they're using it in daylight? And do you ever run into circumstances where you find that heavy feed sign, but it's just nocturnal? Like you're not – you're hunting it, but you're not seeing deer during daylight in that spot. Does that ever happen, or is it kind of just regardless, like they're going to be there? So through the years, if you want to use the word evolving, my personal bow hunting tactics evolved when I got hold of Murray's book. You're exactly right. There are there is nocturnal situations. Generally, my hardest hunting is later in the season, not early in the season. So Jeff Murray's plan 
has your best hunting every other week with the moon. And during that every other week, there's only four days in a seven day period that's like hot as a firecracker. You better get a divorce, get a babysitter, get a divorce. I almost would lay out of church if I thought God would kill me, but it's that good. It's literally that good. So when you read Jeff's book, it literally, it's almost like Sonny wrote it. He was the only guy that I ever saw that wrote something that this old timer taught us. I said, man, he's talking about droppings. He's talking about white oak acres. He's talking about feed sign. And he's combining that with the moon. Now, this was the thing Sonny still to this day, and I'm, not, I'm he's my mentor. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with him about it. But I figured out something that he tried to figure out, and well, I didn't figure it out. Jeff Murray figured it out. And I went back and asked Sonny, and he said, "Man, I don't know about that." I said, "Well, watch." Sonny would say to me, "There are trees, feed trees that deer would feed on in the morning. There are feed trees deer would feed on in the evening." And then he would say this, and then there's sometimes there's a feed tree. Man, they like it so much they'd be there morning and evening. He said that you know that's that's when you really know you got one. Guess what Jeff Murray said? So Jeff gives you four days. So he said there's a 12 hour interval on that moon phase. Deer feed this 12 hour part, this 12 hour part, right? So let's use our time right now, which is crazy. So it's gonna get daylight at 5 36 o'clock. And if your moon phase is calling for a feeding time at six o'clock in the morning, 12 hours later, it's six o'clock in the evening. It's still daylight, which means those deer were feeding quite, he's, what does Sonny say? Sometimes morning and evening. He couldn't figure out it was, he was on the right spot the whole time. It was what you just said. They're nocturnal because of the way the moon phase is moving and I'm trying to time this feed with the moon phase. That's what I started doing now. So if it was showing a, let's say it's a nine o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning feeding time, well, they're going to feed again nine o'clock too, but guess what? It's dark. So that made your morning feeding good, but your evening, they wasn't there in the evening. They were, they were just there when you left. They're feeding in the evening and they're feeding in the morning. They're feeding twice a day. So you are right. When you say, have you ever found them and they just wasn't there? Yes, absolutely. But what's happening is I'm just going to now watch that moon phase till it gets right. Um, you can't see it, but there's a deer over here to my right. It's a pretty nice nine point. I went in, found the deer, tearing the place all to pieces, big old feed tree in there. My brother's freaked out. New piece of property we had. Man, let's go kill him. Let's go kill him. I said, we're going to kill him. I said, but matter of fact, I'm going to let my wife kill him. And it's going to be next Tuesday. He's like, come on, man. You don't believe that moon stuff. I said, well, I'm just telling you so far, what I'm watching with it, the dead gum thing is, is 80% right. And it's showing my best day for her is going to be next Tuesday. The deer's in their feet. I know they're in there. He's pawing the whole place up too. And if he's going to show up, he's going to show up when that moon's right. And all of those are you know, when she killed that deer the next Tuesday, she has never climbed a stand. She was shooting a seven millimeter Browning Magnum and couldn't hardly hold the gun up. And I left her in the stand for the first time in her life. And she shot the Joker the first day she hunted. He's on a feed tree. Sign was everywhere. But if I would have hunted him, I would have been probably in that nocturnal situation you were just talking about. And the only thing I'd done was hunted the same spot. I just waited till that phase got right. Cause Jeff said it, you take that moon. It is a primary feeding situation. That's what that moon is about. It's not that you hunt when the moon is good. You hunt the right feed source when the moon is good. And in their case, Jeff Murray was in Illinois. So that's corn, you know, these big corn fields. And so he would go out on the corn field edge when the moon was correct. Well, what I'm doing is I'm going to the feed trees when the moon is correct because that is the primary during that time. I'm just going to the feed tree, doing the same thing Jeff was doing in Illinois. And it is a, literally a deadly combination, but you do get that. And they don't need to get discouraged with that. But I hunted that tree, signs everywhere, and I didn't see nothing. I bet you this much. I bet you come back the next week when that moon alternates and you go to the same spot and there's deer gonna be on it. Now I'm gonna give you a proof test of that. You guys can do it in Alabama. 
beside me is one of the best processors in our state. He's right beside my church. I, when I started studying that pattern, I said, well, you know, anybody can get lucky. But that processor is going to tell you what everybody's doing. I would go to the processor and talk to Kyle, and I said, Kyle, you taking any deer? He said, man, we've had so many deer, I ain't got nowhere to put them. He said, we had to, we had to shut it down. I ain't, got nowhere to, I ain't got nowhere to have to put them. I go the next week. Kyle, you taking any deer? No, nah, they ain't killing many. I don't have to slow down a little bit. I guess it's the weather. That's what he said. Well, guess what? Deer ain't got no air conditioning. They got to eat when it's 105. They got to eat when it's five. Deer's got to eat. The next week, it would be packed again. It was every other week. Them processors were filling up every other week. That tells you what literally everybody's doing. Well, the taxidermist could tell you the same thing. Man, we got a week full of them. We got a week off. We got a week full of them. We got a week off. Well, that's what Jeff Murray's cycle says, that every other week in that phase of feeding on a feed tree is good every other week. So here's my policy. I'm a pastor, and I'm a wife, and I can't afford to pay this woman if I get a divorce. So I'm going to go hunting every other week unless there's a storm front coming in, and then I'm going hunting because I know they're going to feed regardless of the moon. So I took the moon, and if I've got to schedule days off, I'm going to schedule my days off when the moon's good. If I'm going to plan something, I'm going to do it when the moon is good according to his, his cycle. And then I'm going to hunt them feed sources when I do it. And so far, so good. I took 10 children, my, not my last year hunting real heavy, but 10 children probably under the age of, of uh, 11 years old, 11, 10, 9, 8. All 10 of them killed their first deer on this, on, on this cycle. All 10 of them killed their first deer the first time I took them. The first time I took them, everyone of them killed and now some of them was does, some of them was bucks, whatever, but the deer are on their feet and they're moving. That's what you're after. They're on their feet, they're feeding and they're moving and they're going to these trees. They're going to be in there. Um, but I will say that nocturnal thing is something I get hit with. And they said, man, I went in there and hunted. He went out. It's okay. Don't, don't sweat it. If you've done your homework and you're in the right spot, just go back next week when that moon starts to phase out. And they'll literally call me. A lot of guys will call me and say, Hey, what are you? When, when are you going? Because <laughs> they know if I'm gonna go, then the moon must be pretty close. And uh, and and I'll go when I can. But I will tell you, in timber company, when I called Jeff about this, Alabama's gonna be the same way. We are timber company, tim timber country. Y'all are timber country. I asked Jeff. I said, now what about this moon phase and feeding in a clear cut cut over? He, you know, he said, what is that? He didn't know what it was. See, they are farmland. I said, well, you know, they come and they log our, our properties, and we get these clear cuts that come in. And we see deer, big deer, nice deer, when the moon is bad. He said, well, what it is, you're hunting in their bedding area because now you got a, you got a capability of seeing down in that thing. And he said, we don't have that capability. You know, we cut a cornfield. They're not going to be in that cornfield. And he said, so th they're in there moving around in that bedding and feeding area. And then what your biologists are telling you is great feeding area uh, during that time of hunting. And uh, and Jeff concurred. He said, that's why you're seeing them when the moon is not good. So our guys would say this. We're going to hunt cutovers when the moon's bad. We're hunting the feed trees when the moon's good. We're going to bow hunt the feed trees when the moon's good. And it's a constant success. It, we're just moving when they move. We're just moving when they move. But we know they're going to be in the cutover. We know they're going to leave that cutover. They're going to them acorns, and we're going to go to them feed trees when the moon's good. And when it's bad, we're going to go to the cutover, and we're still going to catch them getting up, coming back. We're still going to do it. So it's kind of some of the scenarios and the way we, we roll around that. And Sonny's six state records, I think five of them came out of cutovers when the moon was bad. So that kind of goes to tell you with Timberland, which you can do in the south, especially here in South Carolina. Oh, dude, I'm so excited. I'm just giddy right now. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> oh, God. So, uh, Rick, one thing you brought up, uh, and I, I want to kind of give some more context for, for listeners. You're talking about a 12-hour cycle with a moon. For, for listeners uh, or viewers that don't understand what we're talking about, 
We're talking about the overhead underfoot of the moon. So if you look at feed charts or everything, it's going to kind of have that time frame on there. Um, and I'm sure Jeff Murray's book uh, talks a little bit about this. But it's that 12-hour cycle of, like, at say you were saying 6 o'clock in the morning, it could be overhead. And 12 hours later, 6 p.m., it's going to be underfoot. And that's that major uh, movement time, major feed time. Uh, our buddy Michael Pike, who's actually out in, like, Montana right now, driving around for, like, two months, is hanging out. <laughs> uh, he's really paid a lot of attention to this. And this is it's an interesting discussion because, again, I can already hear it right now. We've got listeners typing us messages and emails saying there's absolutely zero proof, zero scientific proof that uh, moon position or moon phase uh, adds uh, anything extra to, to deer movement. And uh, I, 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 have, I don't have a, a stance on it because I listen to guys like yourself, Rick, who has this success. We've interviewed a ton of guys this summer who have had success paying attention to that moon positioning and keying on that specifically on food sources. And again, talking food sources here, not necessarily hunting and bedding areas, but hunting food sources, these designated food sources, and seeing tremendous success doing so. Um, and, and we kind of, we hashed this out a couple weeks ago on another episode. Yep. And uh, anyways, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Just again, like your thought process and the sis you guys have had, Sonny's had, and even Jeff Murray's book has talked about just focusing on these time periods and, and putting, trying to put everything in your, uh, in your corner as in, getting as much right as possible to hopefully go out there and have the success you're trying to have. Um, with that, one thing I want, I want to ask you about, you, you were talking about what Sonny had mentioned, the whole idea of like, you know, he thought some trees were better, you know, morning movement, feeding times, and then some trees would be better afternoon movement, and some trees it was just best all the time, you know, morning and evening. Have you had much success bow hunting mornings, especially maybe later in the morning, killing bucks or killing deer on feed trees or majority is your success kind of those at the afternoon time period so if you if you follow his moon phase guide it's going to show let's use daylight if daylight's hitting at six o'clock you're going to be a six o'clock so he'll have an abc rating so a being your best day well out of four days only one of those days are going to be an a day Two weeks later, out of four days, only one of those days are going to be an A day, which shows you a morning and evening. Make sense? So I would dare say my best success has always been in the 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock time frame, not necessarily midday. Because when you start getting midday, you start talking transit times, a lot of that. And I'm, a lot of times my schedule just doesn't permit that. So I'm going to harness my energy to hunt morning in those time frames or evening in those time frames, not necessarily midday. I'm not against midday hunting. Um, it's just that my schedule many times does not fit a midday calendar. But I will say if I follow this process. Now, a lot of the guys today that have the discrepancy about the moon have not heard of Jeff. Jeff is now was a great Christian man. Uh, has gone on to be with the Lord. He died of a brain aneurysm, a brain tumor. Um, and I spoke to him in the latter stages of his life. I'm not big on a lot of writers. You know, I'm just, I just, I'm not a big reader of stuff. I, I, I was trained by the old school. And there's so much stuff today that's just money driven. And you don't even know what to believe. You know what I'm saying? And I'm speaking to the guy that's like a skeptic, right? But Jeff was not in that ballpark. What Jeff took was, when you said the word, and that's what struck me, scientific proof. That's what Jeff used. The scientific proof came out of Texas. Texas collared these deer. And when they did, you know, Texas was the head of the management program before. I think anybody pretty much in the state thought about managing. Texas was way up there in the management stuff. Nobody ever heard of it. You know what I mean? Managing deer, like, what are you talking about managing deer? You know what I mean? Nobody ever heard of that. So they collared, radio collared these deer, and they watched the actual deer movement when the moon phase was going on. And here's what they said. When that moon was correct, deer got up on their feet, and they could radio track them. That's fact. Then he would say the only thing that offset that, that would mess it up, and I can concur, but not with deer, but with cattle. He says, if you have a year-round timing corn feeder, it's like a dinner bell. Well, cattle's the same way. I was raised on a farm most of my life. We get out there with cows, start blowing the horn. Now, here they come. They knew what the horn was. We could throw hay off the back of the truck. Cattle was the same way. That feeder, a consistent feeder year-round, 
literally trains those deer to change a pattern. Another thing that'll change a pattern of the moon that a lot of people don't equate is if you do a lot of urban hunting, which I love. I love the fact urban hunting has no pressure on, you know what I mean? And they get a chance to grow and they get a chance to get bigger. Well, urban hunting will also affect the moon because they will not move until things settle down. Lawnmowers cut off and you know, all the dogs quit barking. Deer get up and move. Even if the moon is good, they won't move. So the habitat or the surroundings of urban deer affect feed trees. It affects the moon phase. Deer will change their pattern when they move according to the traffic that is around them. Now, if it's in a standard setting where people's got, you know, tracts of land to hunt, they're in the country, deer should stay on that pattern normally. So we're here, here is the study. The study is in the book Moonstruck. He talks all about it. Remember now, Jeff Murray is a writer for Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, when there was no technology. These boys are writing in magazines, and I know people don't know what a magazine is anymore, but they were writing in magazines about the study of these deer and the, and the research from what I can remember all of this. If you did this, if you type in just Google search right now, Jeff Murray, Moonface, and all of a sudden, you're going to see him outdoor, field and stream, all these other magazines. He was the leading author of this. And he picked it up by following the research out of Texas. And if I remember in his book, he specifically mentions Texas where they collared the deer and they would watch their feeding habits when the moon was in the correct phase. Now, remember this. This is what these, well, I've, I'm hunting by the moon. I'm not seeing nothing. This is where your skeptics come in. You're hunting by the moon, but are you are you out here hunting scrapes and rubs and rut sign, or are you hunting the primary feed source? But it is linked to the primary feed source only. So it's not going to be affected to the rut, you know, and the rut can mess it up as well. Um, but that, it, it, and I'm telling you, that feed tree thing we're talking about in this segment, this is the most powerful connection it has. I had a, a buddy of mine that was skeptic. We went to school together, hunted together, great friend of mine. And I got into this, and he was like, man, you're smarter than that, Rick. We've been killing deer, man. We killed deer. I said, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out when I'm seeing them when I'm not seeing them. So I started writing it down. I have another guy, if you want to do a segment on the moon, if he puts up his head display, it's going to shock the world. His name's Guy Everhart. He's in Indian land. He's in Indian land. I got guys number on speed dial. Guy's the one that put me on the whole moon thing to combine it with feed. The boy's just about a scientist. And I'm telling you, if he ain't got 25 records on his wall, I ain't sitting here out of our state. Uh, he's a killing machine. But he only, and he's, now here's the thing about him. He didn't have a father who taught him to hunt. He was a guy who grew up, got in adulthood, and wanted to learn how to hunt. Well, like I said, we didn't have technology. All we don't, and Jeff just started buying magazines. I want to read some magazines, learn how to hunt. Guess who he picks up? Jeff Murray. And he starts reading Outdoor Channel about this whole moon thing. Guy Everhart is a killing machine, son. And uh, I'm just telling you, uh, the guy's an incredible, an incredible outdoorsman. But the processors tell you the truth every other week. The taxidermists will tell you the truth every other week. And the only, there's two combinational things I think Jeff said in his study that can vary that whole moon situation. Number one, a timing corn feeder. Like I said, it's going off repeatedly. It gets them on a cycle like, like, like a pet, really. The second thing was the rut. The rut in full bloom, well, a deer just going to go. I mean, you know, they lose their mind. You know what I mean? They're going to go. But when you start talking about early season, bow hunting, feed sources, this kind of thing, it's deadly. I got to where the rut to me can be frustrating because the deer I'm hunting can be three states over. But if I can catch him in both season early, he's on a pattern, man, to eat. You know what I mean? He's on a pattern to a feed tree. He's at his best weight during that time, too. Now, his neck ain't as big, but he's on a, he's on a steady pattern to, to go eat. Uh, or I can wait till it settles down and get over in December and catch a late food plot, you know, something like that in December and I can get him back on a steady pattern again. But once that rut kicks in, you can kill him. You got to hunt a lot and you got to stay on him because he's going to be gone. That feed tree, 
It is the best ticket God ever created for a person to have an absolute great chance at a nice deer or, or filling his tag, whatever he wants to do, because they're consistent. They're just consistent until you, until we mess them up. You know, they're consistent. Rick, right? I, I want to, I want to come back a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about this, the morning hunting aspect saying that, you know, you've had success in the morning, kind of getting up to you said about 10 o'clock or so in the mornings. And then also of course in the evenings, do you do anything different when it comes to access or ha- when you like to get in the stand on a morning hunt compared to how you do it in the afternoons and kind of give some feedback there? Because we actually just interviewed uh, one of our good buddies who kills a lot of big deer now, here in Alabama on public land, Scott Seals, and he loves hunting mornings early season, mostly because of his work schedule. He just likes it, it's a little easier for him to get out there in the mornings, but he always catches like those bucks moving like that between, you know, it might not get light here until – you know, early season, 6 a.m. or so, 5.45, 6 a.m., maybe 6.15. But he's catching those bucks coming back to feed on those trees at 7.30 to, like you said, 10.30, 11 almost. And then, you know, depending on whether or not he's seen any deer, he'll get out of the woods. What is your thought process on, on those morning hunts, specifically early season, getting into that pre-rut time period or time period on feed trees? And, again, the success you've maybe had during that time period. Uh, time, I can't talk. During that time period. <laughs> That's Okay. Um, you know, strangely, I'm not a big advocate of morning or evening. It does have to fit my work schedule. Of course, I'm more of an advocate of the confidence in the tree that I have. If I have found the right spot, he's going to be there. I'm going to immediately just pick up my moon chart. Just let me, let me, let me just see what it's saying. You know what I mean? The second thing is, let me look at this weather over here. Do we got any fronts blowing around? And, and if I do, I know I'm in the right spot. I'm trying to choose the timing. And the timing can primarily be, you know, whether that front's pushing around or whether the moon's off or not. I mean, that that's going to really determine whether I'm going to go in the morning or not. I'm not a big advocate to say I love morning hunting over evening hunting because I've killed at literally more deer in the evening than I have in the morning just because of work schedules. You know what I'm saying? Um but going in the morning, if I'm going to approach the tree, I'm going to get in there before daylight or right at the break. I want to be up, quiet, you know. Um, I'm not plugging people in, but I love a summit tree stand, a viper. It's quiet. It's safe. Uh, I don't want something that clangs around. I, I'm a huge advocate on stealth. You know what I mean? I'm going to get in, and, and I'm going to cover my stuff, and I'm straight up. I'm straight up. And... Um, more so, I think those things are more important than whether I choose a morning or evening. It's it's all about the element of surprise. I got one shot deal here. I got a one shot deal on this deer with a bow. I, you, you know, I know I got one error, but I ain't gonna guarantee two. You know what I mean? So I got to make sure everything's in my favor. So many times, like I said about my wife killing that deer, I wouldn't even go in there. I, I could have went in there the next morning, and I just didn't. It was calling for a perfect moon time in the evening, and I'm already on the feed source. I know that. I said, you know what? I'm going to give her a shot. Let's see what happens. We were fortunate. She got the deer, you know, on that day. Um, but the moon chart is what I'm going to watch more than anything. And and I don't want to hammer that too much because I know the skeptics are there. I tell these guys this, hunt when you can. Everybody has to do that. Hunt when it's feasible for you to hunt. Your work schedule allows, you know, your your finances allow, hunt when you can. But if you got to pick something or just do this, and this will a lot of times be the proof in the pudding, start tracking when you're seeing this deer and then measure that by what that moon is saying. If you're, And that's how I started with it, really, is I started just, man, I seen 10 deer today. The moon was perfect. I seen nothing yesterday, and the moon was terrible. You know what I mean, I started measuring it like that. And I started seeing that more days than none, my better days not to waste time were when the moon was in its right axis. But I would go other days if the if weather was that. And now I'm not a stickler to say, hey, I hunt strictly by the moon. Now that boy I call in here, <laughs> he is military by that thing, buddy. And I mean, he'll tell you I'm going to the steakhouse every other week. And I ain't wasting my time because he's going to be there when I come back. You know, he's going to be there when I come back. So you know, I can take every other week and spend it with the wife, get chores done, and I hunt less, and I kill more deer. Literally, I do the same thing. He'll tell you that. 
I hunt less and I kill more deer. I mean, it's, it, it's the same thing. Uh, but it is because of the way it's rotating every other week. Um, and, you know, I've tried to go against it. I've literally for years went in and said, you know what, man, I got a great day to hunt. I'm going. You know what I mean? And knowing it's a full moon, I'm not going to say nothing. But, heck, I didn't want to sit at the house. I went anyway. But I didn't see nothing. But then my brother's over here hunting a cutter with a rifle, and he shoots one during during full moon. You know what I mean? He calls me up. That stupid moon thing don't work. I told you it don't work. I shot. Well, what was he doing? He wasn't feeding. He's walking through this cutover out there. You know what I mean? So it, you follow what I'm saying? It is a, that primary moon deals with a primary feed source. And the book is called Moon Struck. That's the name of the book. And a lot of your young guys coming up have never heard of this kind of stuff. But Jeff pulled the science from Texas to, to correlate what he what he learned in, through his research. And I think he was pretty much the author of it. You know, what started it all, you know, Jeff was. But I would say that if I have my preference, I love evening hunting because I like to sleep. It's that simple. But if I'm feeling good and I know, hey, hunting's going to be good, and I'm, I'm heading out. I'm going. You know what I mean? Uh, because I know I have more confidence in that tree than I have in the daylight, morning, or evening. That tree's going to produce. The only thing about going in the morning is if you are going to bump those deer off that tree 50% of the time because they're in there early. They're in there right before daylight, and they're going to be in there. And here's another thing. I've had other guys check this with me. On a primary feeding source, a deer will be on a feed tree for 30 to 45 minutes feeding straight. He ain't just browsing, eating on it, going through. He's coming there. 30 minutes, he'll be down there feeding. 15, 20, 30 minutes. I mean, it's crazy. They're, they, they're going to be there. They're not. That's why Sonny kept telling me, don't take a bad shot. Hold that bow, look at that deer, and watch him. He's going to give you the perfect shot. You just got to be patient and let him turn. He's going to keep feeding and turning and feeding and turning until there he is. Let it ride. You know what I mean? Because he's coming to a primary feed source to where he's going to spend some time. He ain't just passing through out there 30 yards. He's coming under you, and he's going to be moving around, which causes you to have patience to make a qu quick ethical shot when you have it. You know what I mean? And, and it's deadly. It's deadly. So so I want to, I want to bring this up. And uh, in an episode we did, by the time this episode came out, maybe a month and a half, two months ago, uh, we did a roundtable episode at this uh, at the Mobile Hunters Expo in Chattanooga with a couple of our past guests, uh, both Jeremy Aaron, Scott Seals, Jonathan Moreland, uh, Carl Brown, and Daniel Lemon. And a few, a few of these guys are big feed tree hunters, really big feed tree hunters. Uh, Jonathan, he's from eastern Arkansas. Uh, he's killed some absolutely just huge deer with his bow uh, hunting feed trees, both on public and private land. And he killed one a couple years ago in the mid-180s uh, with his bow. And on a feed tree, early season, uh, fairly early, I say early season, well before pre-rut in his area. And um, he, he's one of those guys, he'll focus on the moon, he'll, he'll hunt the moon if he has time, if it lines up with his schedule, because he works a lot. But if it doesn't work, he's just still going to go in the woods, but he understands, you know, that, you know, more than likely it's going to be a little bit more of a struggle fest. And the day he went out to kill his deer, he'd already seen this deer, I think he had five encounters already with this buck. Uh, a few of them within bow range just couldn't get a shot off. He, he hunts traditional he hunts with long bows and recurves. Um, wow. And he self films. And this buck is also on his YouTube channel. You can actually watch the whole hunt. He killed this deer. He got in this stand that afternoon and hunting this feature that this buck was consistently using in this general area. Um, he decided to go to that tree and he decided to get in really early in the afternoon. He got in like right around noon because he wanted to kind of get everything settled down and, and just kind of see how the afternoon progressed. And he killed that deer at 12 30 12 45 in the afternoon like literally after like 20 30 minutes in, in the stand that buck came in he was able to get a shot opportunity at that deer and killed it and he, he didn't realize this after the fact but it lined up nearly perfect with that major feed pit pattern for that day uh but but again he didn't really pay attention to it before he got in there and it was one of those days that most guys if you're really looking at the moon charts you know you're talking about that tw that uh midday feed pattern where that you know the moon was i think underfoot at 12 30 that day uh, in the afternoon and it was overhead at you know 12 30 in the morning but it lined up mm -hmm. perfectly with when that buck was coming in there and i think if he went back and i, I think i've talked to him a little bit about 
some of the times he had visual of that buck coming in, there was a pattern with that moon overhead or underfoot of when that deer was on that feed tree. Um, but it, it's fascinating that, again, that wasn't really what he was expecting. He was expecting potentially catching coming in at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, but it came in nearly perfect with it, and it get, made him even more of a believer with it. And we had a really good discussion on that episode about that deer. Um, but it, it's just fascinating Again, specifically the early season, what we're talking about here, like that early season feed pattern on these destination feed trees in these areas of guys like yourself and a lot of these other super successful guys we've interviewed in the Southeast specifically that hunt feed trees, seeing that correlation with that moon overhead underfoot at those right time timing of the day, whether it's in the morning, whether it's in the midday, whether it's in the evening and, and capitalizing on that when that major movement period is going to be. Um, and again, this mm-hmm. makes it extremely fascinating. But I, I got a, I got a question that I, I'm really curious about. I've been kind of sitting here marinating on this. When you're talking about, uh, like let's let's say that it's a dynamite spot, uh, moon phase is right, everything is right, and you go in to hunt a spot in the evening, and let's say it's early season, you're not wanting to shoot a doe or, or a buck that you don't want to shoot doesn't come out or anything, and and you're you're sitting there on that feed tree, and you've got five deer underneath you by the time it gets dark are you just are you just going to chill out in that tree until they leave and you're going to sit there till 11 p.m like what what is your strategy there because i'm assuming you don't want to bump them off that tree so you can keep hunting it that's a great question that is an excellent question that's like the question of the night and i'm really not even qualified i'm I'm really not even qualified to answer that question but my brothers are my brothers are back at the truck and they're like, you know, he ain't coming down. You know, he's going to spend the night in that tree, right? And they're and I, they're up there debating on who's going to go get me out of the woods because I'm not coming down. <laughs> so they can't leave me down there. My wife will shoot both of them. No, I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down. So here's what Sonny taught me about that, which is these guys, I'm telling you, they better gravitate to this question. Sonny said, do not come down on this deer because you're right look you know as it's getting darker and darker i hate this you hadn't seen him but here he shows up and it's dark well what i say he's gonna be there 30 45 minutes well i can't see the joker he's underneath me down there walking around i proved this with a friend of mine who's captain police department we hung together a lot he didn't know i would do this i forgot to tell him if i didn't come down come get me he kind of knew where I was. I was on his property. He knew where I was going to be at. He didn't know exactly. So he has another buddy with him, his his brother-in-law. I'm up in the tree. I got six deer under me. This will blow people's mind. He's coming down through there with a flashlight. Do you know them deer ain't moved? With a flashlight, them deer have not moved. I'm watching him come down the ridge down through. They're talking. Man, I know he's down there somewhere. They just walk, <laughs> Rick. They call, Rick, 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 Rick. The deer moved when they got 30 feet from him. When they, he got 30 feet from them deer, they took off. They said, oh, look at him, there goes deer, he goes deer. And I let the deer get plain out of the way, and he's under me. And I said, well, it's about time y'all got here. <laughs> That's my strategy. So That's my strategy. Because it's, it's so good, I can't come down. I have literally hit deer. I hit a deer in the head with a flashlight in Alabama. So if y'all get one down there mentally retarded, I hit him in the head. And I mean, literally. He would not leave. He would not leave and laid down under my tree. I had to get out of there. It was the last day hunting. I had to get, I just took a flashlight and threw it and he hit him right on top of the head. He jumped up, didn't know he was left out. I just don't come down because you will. Sonny said, Sonny said, they're going to think you're an alien. You're going to scare them to death. They ain't never coming back. Don't come down at that tree. Let somebody, he said, let somebody push those deer off of you because they're used to that. But they have done eased in there with all the caution in the world. And all of a sudden, this monster comes down out of this tree. They ain't coming <laughs> back, brother. They're not coming back to Alabama, much less to that tree stand. You know what I mean? So... But you no, know, you're right. I don't come down. I stay up in there, and somebody's gonna come push them off of me, or I'll give them 45 minutes or something like that, you know. And and then I'll try to figure a way to get out of there if I can. So that that was that 
That's okay. That's one of the thing I wanted to ask about was so it's better for someone to walk in and, and bump them off that tree because that's more of a natural oh, yeah. thing. And the deer's kind of in control there, you know. They're like they saw him coming and they got to prepare for that's it. Right. They're like, should we get out of here? Like, are they really coming over here? And then they get close enough and they're like, all right, we're out. Whereas they felt safe for thirty minutes. Like they feel, they probably feel violated when that happens, man. Like, yeah, so, that's it. That that's exactly right. So, Rick, this happened to me last year. It's funny we bring this up. So, I had this exact same situation happen last year with this uh, two and a half. He might have been a three-year-old deer. If he was a three-year-old deer, he just didn't produce antlers all that great. But uh, this buck came in. I was on the edge of a clear cut right, on, right against uh, some, some real big timber that was also next to some, uh, uh, I don't know how old that clear cut is now. Those pines are probably eight, ten years old. And uh, had a white oak next to me. Dropped It was dropping a decent bit uh, when I got there climbed the stand because i was kind of watching this is uh this was a gun hunt but i was kind of watching that edge of that clear cut next to these pines you could not look into these pines these pines you know they're 15 20 foot tall just thick as heck deer going in and out there's there's rub lines and, and scrapes going out but i knew this hot tree was next to me i was like maybe i could catch one slipping through here and, and get a shot at him well the only deer i saw that day was was that buck Mick, i didn't notice he was even anywhere near me until he's about 45 yards from me coming through this clear cut coming right up to that tree and that deer was around me for over an hour and a half, he got up. Uh, I didn't see him until about 40 minutes to 45 minutes after dark. And I, just based off the sign I found around there, I knew there's a lot bigger buck in this general area, like uh, without a doubt. Well, he came feeding around and started feeding underneath that oak that was literally, I don't know, I wasn't very far off. It might have been 10 yards off to my left. Uh, and there were some feed sign down there, but it was kind of, it was getting that time of the year when it was getting into that, that rut period. So I'm thinking a doe or something might come slipping through. I'm trying to watch out further for, for bucks kind of coming through that clear cut. He stayed around me until I decided to get down about 45 minutes after dark, almost an hour after dark. I was sitting in that stand. We had buddies hunting across the road from us. And I'm texting my like, hey, guys, I'm not coming out of the stand because this buck's here. I don't want to bump in case that bigger buck's further off. I didn't want to bump him. And then he's like, what just happened coming out of this tree? Right. This buck, right. I'm filming him. It is, it is, it is so past legal light, and it's like the the moon was out, s- stars are out. You can barely see the crest of that orange of like the the last part of a sunset. But I mean, it's to the point like you can't really see all that well. And you see this this black figure of this deer down below me just feeding around. I can hear my buddies at this time. They're hiking. They had to hike out a good ways to the truck. I wasn't very far from the truck at all. There, I could see their flashlights. They're probably 150 yards from us. See their flashlight. I can hear them talking. There's three of them walking back to the truck. That buck just stands there, and he can kind of see their light and everything. He can't really see them, but he can hear them talking. He's just watching them. I'm watching the buck, watching him kind of filming my phone a little bit, and you can't really see much of my phone. But that buck, that they go back to their truck, and he just stood there and watched them, watched their light until they started their trucks up and drove out. And at the point that they, he couldn't hear those trucks in that gravel road pop anymore, he just went back to feeding again. And I'm sitting here, and I'm like, and this deer's, I mean, if I was Tim Wells, I mean, it's in Tim Wells' spear range. This deer is underneath me. You know, it's 8, 10 <laughs> yards from me. And I'm just sitting there like, man, yeah. what, what am I going to do? Because at any point, there, that bigger deer is probably going to come into this general area. And I sat there, and I think it was getting dark at that time, about 5, 545 or something like that. And I sat, it was about 630, 645, that deer's not moving. And I'm like, I got to do something. So he finally gets out about 30, 40 yards from me. I'm like, I'm just going to start creeping my way down this pine tree, just ever so slowly, just getting down. He lets me get to about, I don't know, maybe six feet off the ground. And, like, I could tell he's kind of watching, listening while he's feeding and stuff. He let me get about six feet off the ground. I turn and look at him. They're just, like, turn around. He's just, like, standing there 30, 40 yards from me looking at me. And finally, when I hit, when I hit the ground, that's when I could hear him ease off and, and like just go back down to that clear cut, back down to that little bottom. And uh, it, it, it just it, it, it blew my mind for two reasons. Number one, how long he sat he sat there and fed. Number two, when it was that far after dark, even with him being that close to me, when he kind of started easing off, as slowly as I was climbing down, because at this time I was using my climber, as he didn't make, even though you know climbing a pine tree, you're making some noise coming out of the pine tree. It didn't put him on alert until my feet hit the ground. And then that's when he got out of there. Um, and it taught me a lot about kind of like in those situations, kind of holding tight. But again, it, it I never saw that bigger buck that I thought was in the air based off the sign and tracks and scrapes and rubs I was find, I was, I was, I was finding. But it was just fascinating to kind of see it, what that 
what that younger buck was willing to deal with in, in that situation. Um, but it's one of those things that, like, if that bigger buck would have showed up, I would have been probably sleeping in the stand for a while and just hanging out and just, like, just seeing what played out. And that's kind of what I was hoping at some point he was going to ease off, but he just never did. So um, not until my feet hit the ground. But it was just a fascinating situation. It, it makes you wonder, like, you know, like you're saying, like, especially on these big feed trees, you know, they're going to hit for 30, 45 minutes, and after that they should ease off. It's just when he eases off, that buck eases off, or you hear him walking off, at what point would you want to climb down? Is it pretty much this when you stop hearing him walk or he starts getting out there? Is there any way you kind of judge based off what you're hearing mm-hmm. of when you're actually going to climb out of that stand? Well, what I'm doing is I'm going to let him get far enough from me that he really can't determine that I'm in the tree he was feeding on. You know what I'm saying? He can hear me, and he knows I'm up there on that hill or wherever it was he was at, but I'm not, like, in the spot he was in. And I'm just, you know, basically the first thing I do or try to do is I got a bag on my back or something. I take my climbing rope, tie it to it, let it slide down. He's out there, you know, 60, 70 yards over there. I can hear him walking. And I start bouncing my bag on the ground like it's somebody walking. And all of a sudden, you'll hear him down there stomping. <laughs> he's down there stomping. And then I start coming down, and it messes it messes him up to where he can't necessarily tell I was in that tree. First thing he hears is something on the ground, walking toward him. You know what I mean? He'll know what it is. And then if I see him down there stomping and blowing, that's good. Let him blow. I'm going to come on down now. But I, tr- I want to get him away a, a enough that I know he cannot determine the actual spot that I was in. And if that makes any kind of sense, because if you do come down on him, it is rare. Especially if he's a wise rascal, he's a little older man. He ain't coming back in that part of the country. You mean what was wrong with that deer you had was that deer was from Alabama and there was something (laughs) wrong with him. You know what I mean? And uh, that's what we say in South Carolina about them roll tide. No offense, but anyway, (laughs) and so, but there was something wrong with that deer. You know what I mean? You don't come down on top. He just looking at you. You know what I mean? And so, that was probably when I hit in the head with a flashlight. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. I'm like, man, he, he might have been kidding yeah. to that one, and he just he passed along some jacked up gene. But uh, yeah, I do I do try to stay up as long as I can, and then when I do come down, you're right. I'm very cautious to, is to let them get as far as they can. I wanna I wanna turn this around to the other side, and and talk about your access. So like. You want to be super, super careful with your exit, too, especially if you want something to stay fresh and keep hunting it. But when it comes to actually accessing a spot, is there anything specific that you do, especially since you don't necessarily pay attention to bedding that much? uh, Is there anything specific you do with access where you're getting in there clean, not only getting in there clean for the hunt that day, but getting in there clean where you can continue to return back to that spot and continue to hunt it? Yeah. So clean you want to get into this segment about what i use or because that has a lot to do with it yes okay yeah it's all going to play a part okay so i have i'm I'm looking one of the most ultimate things to find in bow hunting feed trees is what i call find an island an island is a few trees they left in a clear cut or you know, it's surrounded by a bunch of just junk and swamp, and all of a sudden there's these white oak trees, red oak trees in the middle of that. It's what I call like a little island of feed trees. Well, if that island is in a bedding area, there is no easy access. So what you have to do is create the access, and that is after hunting season and well before season. I, you know, Sonny would. Sonny was a big advocate. He loved to hunt persimmon trees, and I'm I'm with him. I just didn't have a lot on my property. You know what he did? He mowed the grass around them things, man. He would be in there in the summertime, no shooting, no sticks in his way, nothing that could shot in his way. He would be weeding down grass. I mean, it looked like a manicured yard around where because those persimmons were going to produce every year. And he knows he called them Simmons for short, but in Simmons trees, he said, man, clean them up, clean them up, limb them up, man, fertilize them because they come in every year. And like most time you'll find Simmons trees around old home places and just, they're just odd sometimes where they stand out, but clean it up. And, and 
a place that comes to mind uh, my attorney had that let me hunt and he had two big cinnamon trees next to an old home place and as soon as i saw them i was like there's a god man look at these things they were big enough you can put a tree stand in it was just old you know first thing i've done is i went in there with a bush hog and i started bush hogging everything within a 50 yard parameter around them trees but it was in the summertime early on i'm talking like may june you know what i mean and then I was just able to clean it up. And what, what I could do, that created my access. My access in a hardwood hollow is not bad. See, I can just slip right in there. But I'm, I'm trying to get in there before daylight. And I want to be in there, gosh, if, 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 like if I'm hunting this time of year and it's going to get dark at 8.30, I'm going to be in there if prime time is 7 o'clock, I'm going to be in there at 5. I want to be in there two hours, settled in, and quiet. Um, I don't want to walk in there. Now, my job, sometimes I got to slip right in. I've killed them. You know, don't get me wrong. I've killed them because I've got my scent right going in. Uh, but to stay clean, uh, yeah, that's a whole other level. I've only had one time that my system failed. Only one time. And it was about two years ago, to be honest with you. Uh, matter of fact, it was on this deer right here when I killed him. And uh, that deer right there was a job to kill these were the smartest deer in america i think it was because they had a big coyote problem uh, my attorney's property had a lot of coyotes on it surrounded by subdivisions 125 40 acre track of land that he has since sold and i've cried ever since uh but just a sanctuary but those were the most freaked out deer in the world so here was my access. This property had cinnamon trees on it. I wasn't hunting the cinnamon trees. I'm hunting another area. But I used the cinnamon trees to my advantage because my system, they blew it. They literally blew it. And I've never had this happen, not, not since my entire life. I said, I don't know what it is, but they know I'm here. And I don't know how they're figuring this out. You know, people would air out their clothes. That didn't work. People use scent lock. That didn't work. Ozone. That didn't work. Nothing worked. My stuff didn't work. Nothing worked. So what I'd done was I had to end up taking my clothes and literally hanging them in the woods, but getting the Simmons off of that property. And I gathered them in a Ziploc bag and I raked them on my boots, raked them on my clothes, raked them on my stand when I got there. And that's the only thing, because that stuff was strong, that literally they just would get calm enough to ease in there and feed. But before that, if there's anything normal, what we do works. And uh, and I can talk about that if you want to. That's just up to you. But being clean going in, in my case, is this. I'm not a big advocate, nor is Sonny, nobody we hunt with on scent lock clothing, ozonics. We're not against it. I'm sure out west, a lot of that stuff is necessary and sometimes works well. We just simply don't need it. Um, we have camouflage from walmart if we want to wear that i've hunted in blue jeans and a camouflage shirt i really don't need anything i'm high enough off the ground i'm not really worried about him seeing me as much um but i've got to get in a situation where he can't see me that's the main thing but we use a product now i want to tell you about the product before i explain to you what it is it's 89 1989 hugo is hit freezes everywhere can't kill a deer Deer's blowing off on me my whole life. And Sonny hands me this stuff in a bottle. He says, use this. This That blowing stuff is over with. He said, son, you bow hunting, and they're going to be on top of you. Okay? So you're going to have to use this. Make sure you clean going in the woods. What he meant by that was have clean clothes. You know, try not to go right after work. And he said, whatever you do, don't pump gas and go hunting. Get your gas the day before. Get your gas on the way to work. But gas is stronger than this stuff. But use this. Literally, literally, it ended. All of my blowing on deer, I never got blown on after that, ever. I'd be sitting on the ground, wouldn't get blown off. It didn't matter where I was at. Deer never knew he was in the country. Well, he wouldn't tell me what it was. He'd give it to me in a clear plastic bottle and said, if he told me he had to kill me, and he would not tell me what it was. So we're in 89, before technology and all the stuff that we know today, and he had used this for generations and the people before him for generations. It's, this stuff could have been back to the settling of the country. The Indians could have used this. We don't know. 
but I do know it is a natural substance in our state, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, Always, I've used it in Alabama, where y'all are. I've used it in Georgia. I've used it in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee. All the Southeast region, it is predominantly, and it's there. Well, he's leaving. Sonny took a job with J.O. Jones during the Gulf War before you guys were born. It's the first time we ever saw live warfare on TV. They're going to rebuild Kuwait, and he's an engineer by, by trade, and he's going to go help rebuild Kuwait. He calls me. So it's come over to the house. I'm taking you to the drugstore, to the pharmacy. I said, for what? I got to go get you your scent stuff so you can have it while I'm gone. I said, at the pharmacy? You getting this stuff at the pharmacy? Yeah, let's go. Come on. We go to Hardy's, get us a biscuit, pull over to the pharmacy, pulls out a little old bottle off shelf about that big, a little bitty bottle, a little brown swan product made it back in the day. I said, you're lying, man. Why are you messing with me, Mandy? I mean, why? What is it? Come on, just buy the bottle. Let's go. I got to show you where I get it at. It's been five years. I've been using this stuff for five or six years. And he never would tell me what it was. So we get back to the house. He takes me out back. He takes his pocket knife. He says, follow me. Goes out there to a pine tree. You guys can do this. Pops open a lock blade, digs it in that pine tree. Just digs it past the bark, digs it in that pine tree. Grab me by the back of my head. He stuck my nose in that tree. He said, you smell that? I said, yeah. He said, now smell this bottle. Smell that, smell this bottle. Smell that, smell this bottle. I said, I'd be dead gum. He said, that is the pure extract out of that tree with no additives. This cannot come from a hardware store. It's got to come from a pharmaceutical store. Today, we call that CVS Walgreens, okay? Y'all got them in Alabama? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... He says, get it from the pharmacy because it's the pure stuff with nothing added. Well, back in the day, it was a swan product. Now there's a couple other places that do it. You know, and most of the time, especially like in Alabama, there's a lot of rural area like South Carolina, and there'd be these old backwoods stores, and they would have it. And what it was used for, the reasons in pharmacy, is you can cut your hand and put this stuff on it, and it calms soreness out of your hands. I didn't even know that. So today, they use it for paint thinner. And it's called Curtain Time. And it's got to say, Pure Gum Spirits of Turpentine. Pure. Now, if you go to Home Depot, Lowe's, big hardware stores, whatever, they're going to have this for paint thinner. That's not what you get. This came straight out of CVS. It's not going to be on the shelf. You walk back to the pharmacist, and I'm thinking I'm going to tell in this modern day, I'm going to tell this pharmacist that I need a bottle of turpentine, and he's going to look at me like I'm crazy. You know what he did? He didn't even bat an eye. He said, how much do you want? I mean, he never batted an eye. I went, well, dadgum, they must still use this stuff. He orders me two bottles in before Thesa comes in, and it's about this big, and the one I'm holding, um, what's it say? Oh, four ounces. So for four ounces, seven or eight bucks, you can save a two hundred dollar set lock suit. What's that ozone thing cost you? Probably three, four hundred dollars. Yeah. Yep. I'm talking seven bucks. So the guys that hunt with me didn't believe me. So the problem was they all wanted to hunt with me, but I wouldn't let them hunt with me unless they used that. So I make them use that to hunt with me because you ain't going on my property without it. So you say, how do you approach your stand? If I'm scouting, I got that on. I get out of my truck, my clothes are clean, I'm going to walk for a few hours, a couple hours, an hour, whatever. How do you use it? You take that bottle, put it in your hand, turn it over like that. It'd be a little bit on your finger. Put it on your hat, put it on my shirt, put it on my pants leg. I don't put it on the bottom of my boots because it is stout. So I put it on my side of my boots, my pants leg a little bit, I'm done. You say, man, you know, I was hunting with these old boys from New Jersey in Alabama down at the Red Oak Plantation. The redneck has got the pine saw. You know how they talk. The redneck has got the pine saw. He's eating, drinking a pine saw. They didn't know what it was. It freaked them out. I went down there, man, and we waylaid them. And then, boys, you know, the guys that owned the lodge wanted to know, you know, Buckmasters has called me. You guys are the first people in that seminar I did. That's the first time that we ever disclosed what this was. And we have used it for 40 years. And a lot of guys says, man, I had them blow off on me. I'm not doubting that. I'm not doubting that. But was it this, and did you have too much on you? Because it don't take much. It don't take much. 
You say the deer can smell that. Yeah, they can smell it. But you you got to understand something. They say, well, I'm hunting in an acorn hollow. It does not matter. Pine trees are native to the southeast, and they are strong. And when a deer is walking through the woods, that's what he is smelling, that and these acorns, and he's used to that smell. By it being the pure extract, there is no additives to this. It's not. It doesn't have paint thinner in it. It doesn't have nothing cutting it. It is literally straight out of the pine tree. You can take pine needles and burn them in your hand from a young pine tree. Smell it, and it smells just like that, just like that. Uh, if I run out of this, I'll take young pines getting out of my truck and burn it on my hands and put it on my clothes and stuff, and it just aromas the whole thing. It smells just like it. So Sonny gives me this. He leaves the country, and we continue to use it for years. There are guys right now that are in their 50s and 60s that all hunted together, Sonny. Uh, we all hunt the same way. And all those guys, to this day, this is their go-to. This is their go-to. Um, some would some would still dispute. It's kind of like the moon thing. Um, I would say the proof's in the pudding. Everything you see behind me was killed with that. Every deer, we, every friend I've got uses it. I mean, it's just, you know, we, for lack of better terms, we laugh at the scentlock world, and we laugh at the ozone world. It's just that people just don't know. But if I'm out west, think about the region of the country. So Tennessee's going to work, probably Arkansas. You know, I'm, I've never hunted Arkansas, uh, but I'd like to try it there. I've proved it out of, I'm thinking of pines and how that, how that works, where they are in the region. But the whole southeast region, you know, is covered in timberland. And so I would assume it's going to about work the same. I didn't use it in Illinois when I was out there because it's all cornfields, you know, and very little we got woods like they got fields you know what i'm saying they got these massive crop fields but going clean into my stand scouting and my clothes are just i just wash them and look here i don't wash them in nothing special i, I try not to use a heavy fragrance stuff in another but i don't wash them in nothing special um i just make sure they're clean and when i get out of my truck i don't pump gas going to the woods i mean that's it that's my only that's my only philosophy i don't pump gas going to the woods my brother said, man, I got to get some gas. I said, well, you getting that pump because you should have got it because I ain't going to pump or nothing. I'm sitting right here till you get done. Uh, but I will say that right there from Sonny Burgess was the greatest gift that was ever given to me. That, you know, every hunter will say, if you can beat his nose, 90% of the game's won. Um, if you can beat his nose, because now, now you can get in his living room where he can't pick up on you. And that's just going to help you do that. And when we're bow hunting, we are close quarters. This is not 200 yards with a high-powered rifle. This is close quarters, and you you got to cover your nose. And, you know, I just never have had to worry about it. I just don't. You know, if, if I you could look around this room, all my hunting clothes are sitting in this room. They're not in a, a, a cedar closet. They're not in a pine closet. They're not hanging outside. I will literally, as long as they're, cl long as they're clean in here, I'll pick them up out of this room, take them. And uh, well, I'm ready to go. You know what I'm saying? I'll throw them in the truck, put me some stuff on. Let's go to the woods. They'll come in periodically. Um, and I still think many times it's because I'm kind of new sitting out on the edge of a limb. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily this. But your take on it. Go ahead. No, that's – I'm. Uh, when I heard this in your seminar, uh, again, nearly two years ago, I was very interested. Um just because this is a, a cover scent and you know we've done episodes with uh, uh a really big canine handler um who had his own thoughts on, on cover scent but again when i look at this and i talk to guys like yourself and other guys who's used something like this it's you're not making first off you're not making any money on it number one it's not like it's your own brand or no. you gotta go buy it at a sporting goods store which to me also like validates this a little bit more it's not like yeah. you're like trying yeah. to market it uh and make a make a buck off of it um but it's Paul's like... right there. Paul's right there. Can, can I speak into that? Yeah. Now, as we speak, my, my wife is very upset with this broadcast <laughs> because she says this is millions of dollars in retirement and you're fixing to give it away. <laughs> I said, hey, baby, I'm, pa I'm a pastor, man. I got to help people. You know what I mean? That's why I did the seminar, helping a bunch of guys. And no, I'm not, I'm, I don't own this. CVS has got this from somebody. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you what it is, but you're right. 
Too many things today is marketing. It's money. And I understand the game. I understand that people's got to make a living. But I'm here to tell you this. I got a product that says you don't need all that if you're in the southeast, especially if you're in my state in South Carolina. You don't need that. Um, you just stay clean, use this, and it will help you cover your, your tracks, man. I don't put it on the bottom of my shoes. Just remember that. You know, it is stout with his because he walks with his nose on the ground continuously. And uh, but he may pick his nose up, and say, "Man, I got busted. I got busted. Oh, I've had it happen too." But nothing's a hundred percent. That's just about ninety percent. That's all. It's about ninety percent guarantee. And and he can't he can't figure it out. He'll be smelling. Man, I smell it, but he don't know what it is. And he's like, "It's it smells just like what I'm at." And he can't figure it out. You know. But uh, I didn't mean to talk over you, but oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to make several million on that. I was going to make several million, but y'all end up calling me, so I gave it away. So here we are. So. <laughs> uh, Rick, one thing I'm curious with, because you talk about like you're, you're not really using a ton of it, which uh, I've never smelled turpentine, but the way you describe it, it sounds like it's, it's pretty strong with the medical grade stuff that you have uh, that you're getting from like CVS or Walgreens, which of course we have throughout the Southeast. Um, I was curious, and I don't know if you've ever tried it, if you've ever like poured like half that bottle in like a 24 ounce or 12 ounce spray ball and mix in distilled water this is 100 percent distilled for better coverage uh or like your just your overall thoughts on that no because we tried it you know back when i was young i'd try anything you know what i mean if it'd kill a deer i'd buy it kill it grill it eat it i didn't care i'd drink that stuff man if i knew it'd kill a deer well we tried everything we could to make it last longer not necessarily to cut the smell down, but make it last longer. We grinded up acorns. They, they, we were killing so many deer. We took acorns and grinded them up in a blender and tried to make a blend out of it where we could put it on us. I mean, it was just like we would try everything. What happens with this when you put it in a spray bottle is you'll go through several spray bottles because it gum, it's gum. It's the gum out of the tree, so it'll gum up the nozzle. So eventually we just started leaving it in there, but we just don't put it all over us. When you take your two fingers and put it on top of the bottle and you just do it like that, you got, I mean, you're going to smell it right off the gate, just like that. If it's in a spray bottle, it's going to be even stronger than that because you, you're really going to put it all over you then. It doesn't take much, but it's not going to alarm the deer. It's just not. I mean, he, he, can, he can walk by you, get downwind to you. I've had guys sitting there filming with me this, that I made them put it on, wouldn't tell them what it was, and they say, there were six deer downwind of us, and they never flinched. I said, that's right. Six noses, and they never flinch. I said, that's, I, I feel I'm amazed at it to this day, and I used it for 40 years. I'm amazed at it to this day. And I said, I guess those old timers struck into something. You know, they had to use a natural source. That's what the old timers had to do, natural things. And that is as natural as it comes in my state. I don't know about y'all, but where I live, there's a logging truck passing my house every five minutes. Logging truck, pine trees, pine trees, pine trees, you know. And so in the southeast, we're just known for that. And those deer walk in all of that every day. Uh, you come by a fresh cut, clear cut, it smells just like turpentine. I mean, as soon as they cut trees down, it smells just like turpentine. Uh, we have the Bowwater paper mill next to us. And... My buddy Keith brings me, one of my associate pastors works there, brings me the pure extract out of a tree from that corporation. And he said, man, I got you two pints of this stuff. You know what I mean? It was different. Something was different. And I said, that's not, that's not. So they sell that stuff by the tankers. And so there was a company out of Georgia that I found. You can get it by the five-gallon bucket. And I think they take that tanker. And they're the ones that get the right cut to it to get it to the pharmacy for whatever processes that is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't really understand the process of how they get it out of the pine tree. But I do know that when you read the ingredients on this bottle, there is no other ingredient but pure gum out of a pine tree. There is no other ingredient, which lets you know it's a natural product. And there again, that must be why Sonny's telling me, you know, hey, it's got to come from a pharmacy. Don't don't get this from the hardware store. You know what I mean? And uh, of course, back in the days, we didn't have Home Depot either. We just had hardware store. So, but anyway, Andrew, what's your thoughts? Cover sense. 
I think I think I'm gonna make me a trip to CVS this week. I mean, try for out. like eight nine bucks, why I not? I mean, I'm gonna try. I mean, it. like if someone's out there, I mean, I'll what probably do you smell better yeah, anyway. Yeah, like, yeah. what do you have to lose? Like, I, we have so many li- like what, what? like. 95% of our listeners are in the southeast, and they, they probably hunt an area with some kind of pines. Now, if you're in an area where it's mostly hardwood forest, maybe this isn't for you, but if you're in an area like most of us, and you're hunting somewhere, whether it's Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, you know, parts of Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, you know, you're dealing with a lot of pine trees, southeast Oklahoma, um, and I mean, why not? Like, just uh, that's the way I look at it. It's like, why not go try? If nothing else, you'll probably enjoy the smell. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, maybe. smell like a nice fresh pine tree. Yeah. Right, so, hey, look, when I was with Buckmasters in Alabama, and this was years ago, they begged me because they knew when I killed that deer, where the deer came from and how the wind was in his nose. They could not believe it. Remember now, Buckmasters was the original TV program. And so they're like, dude, there's no way that that deer, that deer smelled you, man. I said, no, that deer didn't know we was in the country. Well, I got my best friend hunting right beside me. We was going to film together. He just got a little further apart, so we see if one of us get that pie ball. And, and these like, man, I got it on me too, baby. And he said, we ain't, we, we worry about these deer down here. You know, and, and they just could not get over that. And most people... And they're correct. You got to hunt with the wind. Deer's going to travel with the wind. We get that. I don't want him to know I'm there. I know he's going to run with the wind. I just don't want him to know I'm there. And so if I'm clean and I got a little bit of this on me and it's just going to cover that, hey, I'm good. And like I said, I used it for five years, never knew what it was. Sonny wouldn't give it to me. He was old school, you know. My God, my great grandpappy, 14 generations gave me this, you know. And so he wouldn't tell me, you know, what it was. And then he takes me to the dead gum pharmacy one day. And I was just blown. Abs- I'll never forget that day we walked in. I was blown away. I said, in the pharmacy? What have you been giving me in this bottle? You know what I mean? And, uh, and it, we, we've used it ever since. You know what I mean? We, we just used it ever since. And um, I dare say, gosh, it's, it's thousands of deer. It's thousands and thousands of deer with all of my friends, their kids and their friends and their family, that once we all in our area and in our, I guess you say our group of people that we know found out about this, you know, I got a buddy of mine named Mark Lell. He's a great segment for y'all too. Mark is a killing machine. And uh, I asked Mark about it and Mark said, man, when I go hunt pines, he said, I dive off in that stuff, son, like I bathe in it, buddy. And he said, they're walking by me within five feet. <laughs> he said they're walking by me within five feet they didn't know i'm there you know what i mean and uh because i like to talk to other guys say hey, have you ever tried this you know like the moon have you ever tried it what do you think you know have you ever tried this you know everybody's got their own style and i'm not pushing anything i'm not making a dime off of this today i just like to see guys succeed you know and i've had the privilege and i've been blessed to enjoy this sport you know for my life god has blessed me and and i've just for years now with kids and guys getting started that's why i did the seminar you know i felt sorry for a lot of these guys they wanted to do it they didn't know how they didn't know how to get started you know and it's like the lord just spoke to me and said hey man you've been given a gift you know use it help these guys you know and uh you know the bible says better to give than receive you know we're always taken and we have a society this is taking society and i just wanted to give some stuff back and i enjoy it i love seeing people you know succeed in life I'm not a kind of guy. If you kill a big deer, man, I love it. As long as he ain't mine, you know what I mean? Lord, he doesn't kill mine. You know what I mean? I'm just kidding. It's, it's, but, uh, but, uh, but it happens, you know what I mean? And uh, we got a great sport. Uh, I, I, I pray that it can continue. Uh, we have a lot of people in this country that don't like what we do. But I pray that, you know, we can continue that so my grandchildren can, can enjoy it. And uh, these are just some things that we've used that have been proven tactics that if applied correctly, there's a systematic way it's done. You just don't do one or the other. There's a systematic way it's done, and it can bring a lot of great success to people. There's no doubt about it. It's just been proven by too many people, not just myself, but too many people do this in our area, uh, and and they have been blessed as well. So, 
Well, Rick, I'll say this. I found a lot of other things I want to talk to you, but we're already at the two hour mark. And I know we had you on even earlier before that. So it's getting a little late for you. Uh, I just want to say I greatly appreciate you spending some time with us and sharing all this information. I mean, this may be, I may, I may go on a limb and say this might be one of the best, if not the best, feature episodes we've ever done. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, this, this is one of the best episodes of the year, bar none. Yeah. So, uh, Rick, just I greatly appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, one thing I want to kind of lead or end this episode on is what would be like one of your biggest pieces of advice for someone new going out this year? Maybe they've been bow hunting for the last 15, 20 years. Maybe they just picked up the bow for the first time ever, but they haven't had the consistent success getting on deer and even getting shot opportunities with their bow in the Southeast. If they're trying to go out there and hunt features this, this, this early season, what would be a big piece of advice you'd tell them to focus on to hopefully get them on the straight and narrow path to start building confidence and having success come this season? Number one, stay off the TV. TV has too many opinionated angles of stuff. You know what I'm saying? You can't believe everything that's out there. Always remember this, and I'm, I, again, I don't mean to hammer this. I'm a pastor. I believe the book, The Love of Money is the Root of All Evil. So people will do anything for a dollar. They'll sell you anything for a dollar. And deer hunting can be made very simple and successful without spending a fortune, without having to get in all that. You say, I got a small track of land. Well, you know what? Let's learn how those deer are eating. You know, I'm not against baiting at all. You may have to do that. You, you may have to bait with corn uh, to get the deer where you are. I'm all for that. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm Everybody's to his own. I'm great with that. Okay. But... The best piece of advice is to learn the woods. You know, when I started, I didn't know a pine tree from an oak tree. I didn't know nothing. And Sonny said, come here. This is a white oak tree. This is a red oak tree. Do not forget these two trees. A lot of guys don't know that. They're getting started. Learn those two trees. And study them in your yard. Look at them at the park. You, you know, you can you can be on your lunch break eating lunch in the parking lot and watch acorns fall and say, man, them acorns are falling early, you know, or there's acorns on the ground. You know what I mean? That's kind of signs that you – let's get in the woods and look. But the first thing they need to do is learn their property. Learn what a feed tree is. Learn the difference in them. Um, I watch guys on SC deer hunters all the time, Sacramento deer hunters, and they'll get on there with persimmons. And they'll say, man, what are these things on my property? They don't even know. They don't know what a persimmon is. And part of me is like, man, why don't you know that? You know, it's almost like God speaks to me and says, well, you didn't know it either. Remember that now. You didn't know it either. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. Forgive me, Lord. You know, I didn't know. So so learn, learn the woodsman of it. This is going to help cover you up to give you odds. Learn how to look at what y'all call scat. We call droppings learn that you know this is fresh this is not you know what i mean i don't know if you boys ever watched <laughs> pk and mike back in the day some of those old clips the greatest that ever lived These guys were crazy man they put goobers and raisin nets on the ground look like deer droppings and went to eating them in front of people i mean them dudes were crazy <laughs> but they were right because they look just like deer droppings and a lot of guys don't know they'll get on facebook right now today and say what kind of droppings is this and it'll be a raccoon. You know, we're talking about guys who don't know nothing. Your teenage kid growing up fixing to learn. Spend some time in the woods. You can't learn it on TV. You got to learn it in the woods. You got to get in the woods to do that. Um, so find the trees, find the sign, and you will find the deer. Now, I, I have no remedy for fixing nerves. If your nerves is shot when that deer walks out, I can't fix that because I can't fix my own. I still get jittered. I'm like, I'm fixing to kill this joker. But, I, you know, if I ever lose that, I'm probably going to quit. You know what I mean? But but finding a deer, and I have guys that have called me in the past. I really enjoy it. Hey, Pastor, hey, would you come? I got this piece of property. Would you come and just walk it with me? You know what I mean? I don't get to hunt much anymore, but I do, and I love to get out and walk and just enjoy it. And do what Sonny did with me. You mean a guy starting out finds, and I'll tell the guys that are experienced, you owe this generation coming to teach them. You mean to help them. Somebody helped you. Somebody showed you, you know, 
but they're so competitive, you know, in this day and hour. Oh, he's going to get my deer. He's going to get my deer, you know. And sure, they might get some, they may not. But invest in this younger generation coming up because we have a dying breed of a sport. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of agendas out here today that does not want what we do. And if the powers that be get their way, there won't be. But if we keep investing in these kids and investing in people that want to learn, we can always have a thriving sport that will continue. But that piece of advice is to get in the woods, not TV, not social media, get in the woods. And that's where you're going to learn. God's nature teacher is the best. There is no better. And, you know, start early in the season. I used to do something a lot of people didn't even understand what we'd do is if I found a spot and I wasn't sure, you know what I'd do? I'd go hunting out of season, literally. Take my stand, climb in the woods, no weapon in my hand, back off from it. You know what? I'm going to be sitting at the house watching TV anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think I'm going to get my stand and go sit in the woods a little bit this afternoon. I ain't taking no gun. Law can't lock me up, but I'm going to sit there and watch, see what's going on. Take me a pair of binoculars, back off of it, and watch it, and see if I'm right. Just see if I'm right. See if I'm in between spots or something like that. And that's nature's the best teacher. It's just the best teacher there is. Um, but I've enjoyed the segment, guys. Appreciate what y'all are doing to bring attention to the sport. So um, this is what we do in South Carolina. I mean, it's how we do it. And uh, and it might not be for everybody, and I totally can respect that. Uh, but I do know that there are some things here that, that was given and handed down to me that we just, we're just passing it on. We're just another generation passing it on. So. Absolutely. Well, Rick, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Guys, if you've enjoyed this episode, I'm sure you have. If you've made it this far to the episode, you've definitely enjoyed it. Make sure you share it with a couple of buddies, especially maybe if you do live in South Carolina. So share it with a couple of your other buddies oh, in South yeah. Carolina. But um, And then also, if you enjoy this episode, go leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. Tremendously would help out. Let us know what you liked about Rick. And uh, and also, if you'd want to hear some of Rick's buddies on the podcast as well that he's name-dropped in this episode <laughs> that I'm very interested to talk to. Yeah. So, um, appreciate everybody listen appreciate everybody watching and rick thank you for joining us for this episode from the southern outdoors and podcast thank you my friend enjoyed it